including one of the organizers. Welcome everyone. Um, as you know, this is the final workshop of this series, and we have discussed the issue of tax rate and investment in the last uh, one and a half months, should we say, and this is the final one. And we have policymakers, we have academics, we have experts in the topic of tax trade and investment. So today we also have another moderator, so no one of the conveners like normally will happen. We have moderator Nana Amasarco from Tax Notes International. She will have also the, the challenge to, to keep on time and to make sure that uh, everything goes smooth. What we have right now is perhaps a short introduction to our work, what we started with this discussion on tax rate and investment to see whether there are links between and interactions that could be in these topics and we find we found them and therefore in the first workshop we can provide a theoretical background to to what it means to have these interactions then the second workshop we also discuss about um, trade and digital taxes and I will give then the word to Hildegard to perhaps say a little uh, about herself and then after to Augustine and Julian Chase is not here at this moment, but he may join a little uh, later. But Hildegun, please go ahead. Yes, so my name is Hildegun Chivik Nordas, and I work at the CEP for the time being, and also at the um, Örebro University in Sweden. And uh, before that, I actually worked at the, uh, the OECD and uh, in the division that Marion is heading right now. And uh, so I worked a lot on uh, trade and services and, uh, and issues related to that, um, the two governance of trade and services. And uh, I also noticed something interesting during these workshops. So when we talked about FDI and services, some of the issues that, uh, that we talked about were actually problems if we focus on trade and services and the trade rules books. I thought that was kind of an interesting perspective and, uh, and also kind of the uh, relationships between tax and uh, investment and trade policy, how they come together right now in the discussion in the BEPS and the G7. So I'm looking forward to um, this last seminar as well. Thank you. Thank you. And please note that we have all seminars have been recorded and we have made available as, as much as possible also the presentations. So we will send the link also in the chat so you can have the recordings. Agustin, I give you the word. Yes, thanks, Irma. Yes, my name is Agustin Redonda. I also work like Hildegun uh, with the Council on Economic Policies, CEP. Um, I lead the fiscal policy program here, and our niche, if you want, is uh, on tax expenditures. So we are very interested in the use of tax incentives, tax expenditures, also in the context of uh, attracting investment, for instance, and the trade implications of, of some of these uh, tax incentives. So very much looking forward um, uh, to today's event. Thank you uh, to the speakers for having taken the time, and to Nana for being here. So yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Irma. Julian Chase is not yet here. Uh, he may be having some hearings that is delaying him, but he is also from the City University of Hong Kong, an expert on investment. And he has also been uh, discussed and he has led the, the workshop on dispute resolution. So please, I will give now the word to Nana. Uh, you are taking control. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And also thank you to Juliana Cubillos and Frederick Heidmuller for all the work they have done to organize this series of workshops. Thank you so much, Irma. Hello, everyone, and good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on your part of the world. As Irma mentioned, my name is Nana Amasarfo. I'm a contributing editor with Tax Notes International, and I am very thrilled to be moderating today's fifth and final session. So we have a very robust and distinguished group of experts today who will be providing their reflections on the interconnections between taxation, trade, and investment in our era of globalization and also digitalization. So just to provide a quick roadmap for today's session, um, each speaker will give a roughly 20 minute presentation. 
And immediately following each individual presentation, there will be a short Q&A um, period. So if you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A box below or in the chat box below, and we will pull them up accordingly. From there, we will have a short break, and then we will reconvene for some final remarks from the organizers. So with that, let's start the roundtable. Our first speaker is Marian Jansen, who is director of the OECD's Trade and Agriculture Directorate, where she oversees analysis, advice, and support for policy reform in several fields, including food, agriculture, and international trade. And that work seeks to advance a better understanding of the international trade system and the economic, environmental, and social context in which it operates. Previously, Marian was coordinator of the Trade and Employment Program of the International Labor Office. And before that, she was a counselor in the Economic Research and Statistics Division of the World Trade Organization. Marian, we are so thankful to have you here today. Thank you so much. And the floor is now yours. Thank you, Nana. Thanks for this introduction. And thanks to the um, organizers for inviting me to this, um, to this meeting. I'm truly thrilled uh, to be here today because the interlinkages between taxation, trade and investment, and I would add a fourth word, and labor markets is something that has interested me for many, many years and uh, that I have found uh, hard to work on, on for many, many years. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to see that these areas now come together. Um, I was um, indeed introduced as the director of the Trade and Agriculture Directorate of the OECD. I uh, have a, a job currently that is a, a managerial job uh, in an international institution. So I will give a bit of a political more overview, a high level overview of how I, as somebody leading work on trade in um, uh, the OECD, sees these interlinkages between taxation, trade, and investment. I will start with two anecdotes before I kick off my presentation. Anecdote one, I mentioned already to you that I have been working on the interlinkages between trade and labor markets because over 15 years ago, we realized that there is a concern among, in, among voters in the population about how globalization is working out. And um, in 2000, as early as 2007, I was involved in a publication between the International Labor Office and the World Trade Organization on trade and labor markets. In that uh, collaboration, we wrote about the need for an international agreement on taxation and that this would be important for labor markets. Of that whole book of the collaboration that was highly political, uh, where we were really concerned to be attacked on issues around labor standards, for instance, the one thing was criticized is that we dared to make a reference to taxation in a book that was dealing with trade and labor. So the topic was clearly sensitive. There was one anecdote. The other anecdote, I continue to work in these areas for some time, but I am um, an economist. And I discovered in these over these years that for economists, who are trade specialists to work with economists who are investment specialists, and even worse, to work with economists who are tax specialists, that's very difficult. These are three communities that don't meet and tend not to speak to each other. Interestingly, lawyers find it much more easy to jump from international trade law to international investment law to international tax law. So I hope that also my profession, economists, will become a bit more agile in the future. I think we need it. And with this, uh, I start my presentation. First slide, uh, please. Why do I consider that this linkage is, uh, exists and is important and is definitely important for the area of work that I lead trade? Uh, first, um, there is uh, in our community, is this by now at last established that there is a link between trade and investment. I'm not gonna enter into that, but this we have managed to accept after decades of, of soul searching and research. Why is this uh, linkage with tax then also important for my field? My field? I'm gonna develop three ideas. The first is that tax policies can affect the level playing field in trade. And this is why tax is relevant for trade policy. And I'm gonna say a bit more about where, how that has been dealt with so far. The second point is that tax policy can, policy can and actually does affect investment decisions. 
I'm going to delve a bit deeper into that. And then second, third, um, tax policy can affect the distributional impacts of globalization. And also, I'm going to deal with these two things differently, separately, the perceived distributional impacts. And I think as policymakers, we have to care about how the distributional impacts of globalization are perceived. If not, we get uh, pictures like the one you see here as a visual where people demonstrate against globalization, in this case, even against the WTO. Next slide, please. Here I start um, to um, have one slide, I think, on this issue of uh, the relationship between tax and level playing field. Now, interestingly, if you come out of academic research, if you're a modeler, um, you find it rather normal to model a subsidy as a negative tax, to, to consider these two things to be linked, or a tax as a negative subsidy. This is this, it's nearly an equal sign in between the two. But what is interesting that when it comes to the trade system, the subsidies and the taxes are dealt with rather differently. In the WTO, the, the theme of subsidies has its own agreement. If you subsidize a company, um, this falls under potentially under the WTO, WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. So it is for those of us who work in the trade policy community, very standard to consider subsidies an issue that is relevant for trade policy and relevant for the WTO. Now, what is a subsidy and whether a, a subsidy is a negative tax in a dispute, that's another matter, but subsidy has its own agreement. Taxes are referred to in trade policy, in trade agreements, but typically do not have their own separate arrangement. So for instance, in the 1947 GATT uh, legal text, already over 60 years ago, um, taxes were mentioned in, in several provisions. Uh, my colleagues counted 20 times um, in the original GATT text. So yes, taxes have been considered relevant in trade agreements. They are mentioned in trade agreements, but over time, it's only the subsidy side of the taxation of this intervening with the financial instruments in markets that has led to a separate agreement and very specific case law around subsidies, not around tax. Next slide, please. Investment then. Now, um, I'm not so um, I'm not so familiar with the research on does do taxa does taxation affect investment flows. I know that there are. Uh, research papers that show that taxations, taxes do not really affect trade flows a lot. Um, but without even going into what the research says, I must admit that I don't know it. I have been working uh, some time ago on in the area of investment promotion. And what struck me is that every, nearly every document I've come across uh, that promotes a country or a region as a place for investment, nearly every document makes reference to tax incentives. Tax incentives is a standard investment promotion tool. What I discovered with a bit of a surprise or shock is that even within the UN agencies that help countries to attract investment, develop promotion material that highlights tax incentives. Um, so I don't, independent of what the econometric evidence is, the empirical evidence is, this is standard practice. There is a link in policymakers' mind between taxes and investment. Um, another anecdote, uh, when the G7 uh, brought out its communique making reference to tax collaboration, in Swiss newspapers, there were articles with, uh, with headings saying, Switzerland is developing its new fiscal arsenal. It's new fiscal weapons because it's, there's this sense that fiscality, promotion, incentives are needed to keep the economy uh, running and to maintain its competitiveness. So yes, I believe there's a link between taxes and investment. Next slide, please. Is there, an, um, is there a relationship between tax and the impacts of globalization? And why do I care about the impacts of globalization? Well because it has been clear, I believe, for some time that 
there are parts of the population who are concerned about the impacts of globalization. We at the OECD, not, uh, not this slide, yes, this one. Um, at the OECD, our headline on our Twitter account, OECD trade is making trade work for all. So we're very, uh, we consider it very important that we feel uh, the, the, the welfare effects, the benefits are distributed well. And we are now from certain countries um, hearing slogans like worker-centric trade policy. So the issue of this, what we do on trade has to be important for people. It's very present on, um, on policymakers' mind. Now, there are certain things that clearly trigger the reactions of people. And here I think of newspaper articles like this one, that's only a few weeks ago. When voters hear that big companies or very wealthy people pay lower percentages of taxes than they do, that's not good for the reputation of globalization. And voters won't necessarily know whether the rules for this are set at the WTO, at the IMF um, in Brussels, or at the OECD. They understand they consider something is wrong. And this kind of um, information may simply trigger, I call it, may call it gut reactions. Even if it doesn't affect the real distribution, this people will find it hard to accept. Next slide, please. Here uh, on this slide, you see a chart that we published in a book um, I co-edited and that was published 10 years ago in the middle of the financial crisis, when in international institutions in Geneva, we started to be really concerned about this uh, distributional impact of globalization and what will happen in particular after the crisis. This is a, a chart in an, a chapter by a political scientist, not an economist, and he co comes up with this very simple ex explanation uh, saying, well, if um, there are more losers of trade than winners, this is a, a, a standard chart you would see in a median voter model. You see on your, uh, the, the horizontal line is the zero line. That's your level of welfare before you open up markets. Now imagine that you, this is unskilled in this chart, they lose from opening up. Uh, the unskilled, imagine they are 60% of the population, their level of welfare goes down by, let's say, 20% here. But there's another part of the population that becomes much wealthier. And here it's assumed that these are skilled workers and capital owners. Now, if you have more than half of the population losing from trade opening, then more than half the population would vote against opening of trade. That's a median voter type of model. So what you need to do is to redistribute. And for years, trade economists, trade policymakers, including myself, when I gave lectures on the distributional impacts of trade, I would say trade creates winners and losers. We expected 20 years ago that there are less losers than winners. That has changed a bit over time. But the overall cake becomes bigger. And because the overall cake of losers and winners together becomes bigger, you can redistribute and make everybody better off. And then I would finish my, present, my presentation when I was working at the WTO and say, redistribution is not something we do at the WTO. This has to happen somewhere else. The problem was that this hasn't happened somewhere else. And there may be a reason for this. If the winners of globalization are mobile factors, capital can move from one country to the other. The losers are immobile, unskilled labor. Migration is not something that is very easy. Then standard optimal tax models will tell the fiscal ministry, the finance ministry, tax the immobile factor more than the mobile factor. So you will have unskilled immobile labor losing from trade, and it's the taxation on the unskilled immobile labor going up rather than down. So if you put in our world of models a median voter theorem, and this kind of chart you see here comes from a median voter type of thinking, a stolper samuelson theorem that tells you what we would expect to happen as a distribution effect of trade, and you put on top of that a standard optimal taxation model, your outcome would be that theoretically you can redistribute because the cake becomes bigger, but in practice, it will not happen. Unfortunately, as economists, when, if we, are, uh, we work on political economy, we work with the median voter model. If we are a trade uh, model, 
trade series, we work with the Stelp or Samuelson model. And if we are a finance expert, we work with taxation models. Very few of us look at these three things together. We needed a political scientist to do it. And that's what Carl Spoitz did for us in this paper. This is a, a very important um, issue that may have been going on in the past decades and that hopefully we are currently addressing with the tax discussions that are happening at the OECD. So there are reasons to believe that tax policies have a real distribute, have a role for the distributional impacts of globalization. Next slide, please. Now, I've established, uh, I've tried to establish a link between trade and, uh, um, and um, the impacts and trade and tax, investment and tax and tax and the distribution effects of globalization and therefore tax and the, and, the, and the way voters see globalization. Now, here I ask another question. How do these things in reality and practice play out? Now, in practice, trade and investment is being carried out by companies. It's policymakers who set the rules. But the ones who trade and the ones who take investment decisions are private sector players. Now, private sector players, in particular large firms, they have something that called supply chain managers. These people, supply chain managers, have had supply chain management courses that have existed for decades before trade theorists discovered uh, the, the role of supply chains in trade. Now, a supply chain manager typically tries to optimize the functioning of the supply chain. Um, in this particular case that I'm looking at, he will, be looking, he will be working with the finance department of his company. Now, the company will look at the tax policy, the trade policy, and the investment policy together when taking a decision on where to invest and how to trade, where to import and where to export. These three things are relevant. It's three uh, fields of international economic law. They will look at it together. Now, what do policymakers do? They have tended to look at these three things separately. In the past, we would have three different ministries for these three areas. Now we increasingly see trade and investment looked at in the same ministry or there is a coordination. But tax has always been a different animal from trade and investment. Next slide, please. So what do policymakers do? What you see on this slide is um, information on um, the amount of um, investment treaties, and taxation treaties, that's what you see on your left. And on your right, um, you see trade agreements and you see to which extent investment agreements have been integrated, increasingly investment provisions have increasingly been integrated into trade agreements. Now, what you see on your left-hand side that in the mid eighties, the number of um, bilateral investment treaties exploded and the number of double taxation treaties also increased heavily. So a lot of activity, international activity on working together on tax and investment, but bilaterally. Whereas trade was dealt with multilaterally, we have multilateral trade agreement, taxation and investment were agreed between two countries and separately. Now that started to change as we see in the 2000s where policymakers increasingly understood and accepted the relationship between trade and investment. So they started to integrate investment provisions in trade agreements. So you see um, the dark line is the increase of trade agreements. Now here I'm speaking about preferential trade agreements. So the agreements that are being um, decided outside of the WTO. And you see that increasingly those agreements include investment agreement, uh, investment provisions. So the, here therefore the title trade and investment rules are increasingly integrated. This is not the case for taxation rules. They remain somewhere else, they remain separate. There are references to tax, as I mentioned at the very beginning, trade agreements, but there's no very consistent, coherent integration of these two areas. Next slide, please. So in the taxation treaty world, explosions, 
Uh, we, we spoke in the past about a spaghetti bowl of trade agreements. This is definitely spaghetti bowl. 3,000 bilateral double taxation treaties in force worldwide. A lot is going on there. Now, uh, when people tell me there is something wrong with trade, um, there is uh, this WTO multilateral trade agreements, multilateral trade hasn't done what it was meant to do. I tend to say it's not that the WTO isn't functioning. The problem is that we have no multilateral agreements in other areas, notably in taxation. Hopefully this is going to change soon. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, and I'm now coming towards the end, I'm moving towards slowly towards the end of my presentation at the um, OECD, we have been concerned for some time about how trade affects voters, uh, the population, how the gains from trade are distributed. At the OECD, it has been possible a few years ago to start to link the issue of trade with the issue of tax. So what I wasn't allowed to do in 2007, uh, mentioned tax in a, in a report on trade and employment. It is possible, it was possible two years ago, or this is four years ago, where in this, in this study we quoted these findings that we have estimated that four to 10% of global corporate income tax revenues are lost as a result of base erosion and profit shifting by companies. And we made the re relationship here to the effect this has on the distribution of on the benefit on the distribution of the benefits of globalization. So we considered this relevant for the distributional effects and therefore relevant for the public opinion of globalization. Next slide, please. Um, I'm therefore, after um, not having been allowed to speak on taxes uh, to in 2007, I, after having tried to work on tax, trade, and employment at the ILO during the financial crisis and being told this is too sensitive, you are not allowed to touch this topic. I'm very happy that we are here today to discuss this relationship. And I'm even happier that I'm working in an organization that is working on the inclusive, uh, inclusive framework on BEPS, on baseline erosion and profit shifting. There are discussions going on, negotiations going on. Nothing has been decided yet. We don't know what kind of agreements there will be or whether there will be one. But when I, as a trade economist, only hear these words, in pillar one, we try to ensure that we can tax the winners of globalization. And when I, who has worked in an international labor office here in pillar two, we want to restrain the race to the bottom in taxation, and I know that redistribution will be important and necessary, then I think that this is something that is important and that is necessary in order for there to be support in the broad public for open markets. And this is something we need now more than ever. Next slide. This is my final slide. Uh, I mentioned to you 2007, this is the uh, publication I referred to, ILO, WTO. Uh, first time the two organizations work together on the relationship between trade and labor markets. Um, it was difficult at the time. Uh, we were criticized for making reference to tax in this context, to even suggesting that something like an international tax treaty could be useful. Um, even though at the time this was something that was only in the area of research. Now this theme has moved from research to negotiations um, as that are very much currently going on. As I mentioned, we don't know what the outcome will be. Um, it is a bit frustrating because it means things take a long time. Um, but I want to take this as a positive signal. Things can move, uh, can move also at the policy level. And for all of you who may consider to go in and work for an international organization, I would uh, advise you to be patient, but to not um, give up hope. Things may be slow, but they may ultimately happen. I think this is my last slide. The next slide maybe contains our contact detail. Uh, do it, uh, you have our Twitter account here, our general email account. Contact us if you're interested in our work, and I would be happy to pursue this exchange and this discussion. Thank you. Marianne, thank you so much for that extremely engaging overview. Um, really very, very interesting takes. And as such, I believe we do have a few audience questions for you. Um, so the first question comes from Stephen Shea. 
And his question is, how does the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate interact with the OECD's Center for Tax Policy and Administration? Um, and he's asking this um, because in most institutions, turf protection is difficult to overcome. And he would like to know if um, these discussions are, if, if these issues are discussed together in any formal setting. Well, thank you for that question. Indeed, turf protection uh, is something that exists in most institutions. Um, I've joined the OECD only nine uh, months ago. Um, and um, one of the things that was new about this new director was probably the enthusiasm for all these other areas of work within the same organization. Uh, so um, we, uh, yes, we talk to each other, we work with each other. Um, the um, CTP knows, the center knows that I use every opportunity to make publicity for their work because I consider it and vital, their work vital for the continuation of our work and for support for the work we do in the area of trade. Um, I consider the OECD to be a place that can uh, help to build these bridges between silos because the silo, the turfs we may have within one organization, they exist in national governments between ministries. I've been in situations where, um, where I've been in meetings where two ministries wouldn't speak to each other. And I coming from another organization would be asked to give the, the to make the link between the two. So um, I believe the OECD can play a very important role in this area, also in other areas, trade and environment, for instance, trade and labor markets. And um, I will be determined to make that happen uh, to, to as much as possible within the organization. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Frederick Heitzmuller. And he says, discussions are underway to limit tax competition among countries through global minimum taxes, like pillar two. One argument frequently raised against limiting tax competition is that countries would simply start competing more through other ways, potentially more harmful to public finances, like subsidies. And he would like to know how likely do you think are such scenarios? Um, well, I, I, I hope that um, one day uh, countries will start to compete where they should compete. Um, quality infrastructure, quality investment in skills, research and development. We are being told that those are the competitiveness factors. But I see that many countries de facto consider that their own competitiveness factor is the tax regime. So I'm a bit surprised about this lack of confidence that many rich countries have in their own capacity to compete on other grounds. On the subsidy side, there, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we have a situation that there is, there are pretty clear rules in the trade field, what can and cannot be done. Now the WTO has maybe been weakened a bit over the past years. I very much hope that we are also there on a different uh, curve. The agreements we have there are very elegant agreements. We had a very uh, strong dispute settlement system there. Everything can be improved. Uh, but things should not be broken down because they haven't functioned perfectly. So I'm less concerned uh, because on the trade side and also on the investment side, uh, international rules on how to deal with subsidies exist. Lovely. And I believe that we have a question from Saranjali. So Saranjali, I will give the floor to you so that you can ask that question. Thank you. Um, Marion, I just wanted to ask you, when you talk about redistribution and so trade can have different kinds of impact and there's been a lot of talk and literature about unequalizing impact of trade. Now, if tax were to reverse that, uh, would you say it would reverse the trends in trade as well? So it would be looked at as protectionism. Uh, how do you see these two interacting in terms of redistribution? Um, now, I do think that tax, I would expect that tax has a, um, an influence on trade flows. Um, I'm, and it must have had in the past because there have been all these regimes that uh, made it easy for companies to invest in one place or in the other place and therefore to trade or not to trade. Actually, I wouldn't be surprised if tax has influenced where trade is registered in our statistics. In a place like Geneva, there are people whose job it is to make phone calls and, and, and tell to an accountant where a certain export in which city it should be registered. 
because a lot of the trade is not is not is not physical transport anymore. It's like it's just the uh, signaling in the paperwork a transit. I, I'm uh, I'm concerned that we will discover a lot of things about our trade data in the coming uh, in the coming years. Will it affect trade flows? Um, yes, uh, but if it is, if we have an agreed way of doing this, if we have an international uh, um, standard of how we tax a minimum tax, then uh, this is not. Um, we are not distorting the level playing field. We are fixing it at the same at the same level. Um, it would um, increase the possibility of countries to redistribute, but ultimately governments will do with these taxes what they want. But for the model outcome, theoretically, at, at, at least, they will now have the power to redistribute, which may uh, not really have existed before. Terrific. And now we have a question from Irma, so I will give the floor to her to ask her question. Thank you so much uh, for this interesting presentation. I was wondering, normally when you mention also the investment chapters that are now in free trade agreements, we also see now that, for instance, the European Union has introduced the AU standard of good tax governance, that it used to be only about transparency, a change of information, and fair taxation. And since 2018, also the BEPS for minimum standards is introducing this standard of good tax governance in free trade agreements, economic partnership agreements with African, Asian countries, Latin American countries, Caribbean countries as well. So what is your view on, on this standard being introduced in these free trade agreements of economic partnership agreements? Yeah, there is, um, um, there is one um, drawback to these uh, approaches, which is that often to um, to introduce these kind of um, standards for, for processes and policies, you often need a legal setting and an institutional setting um, that is maybe relatively sophisticated and does, that didn't necessarily exist at the beginning. Um, um, and that's um, a concern we have had with other types of agreements. I think of the, in, the intellectual property agreement. Um, I'm often uh, these agreements, uh, a region like the EU, they would, um, these agreements would either directly or indirectly come with an, a possibility of access to technical assistance, to funding to build institutions. And um, I would advise a developing country to use that opportunity to think of liberalizing and building institutions at the same time. We have now seen in the trade facilitation agreement at the WTO, we have an explicit link there. Um, countries, developing countries commit to liberalizing, so to doing something, but only uh, under the condition that there has been help to build a certain institution. Now, in the agreements you mentioned, Irma, maybe that direct link may not be there. Um, there is, um, I'm not the only one thinking that these direct links are a good thing to consider. Um, but I do definitely think that if the country builds institutions and accepts these common rules, that it's not bad for the country. All right, now, unfortunately, we don't have time to get to all of the questions for Marion, but we will close with one final question from Augustine. So I will give him the floor. Thank you, Nana. Uh, thank you, Marion, for the great presentation. So you mentioned um, the empirical evidence and how uh, no matter what the empirical evidence shows, there is a relationship between tax incentives and investment for, uh, in the perspective of, of policymakers. And in my opinion, that's the elephant in the room, right? The lack of uh, effectiveness of many tax incentives to actually attract investment. And um, on the other hand, we see that these are very relevant uh, tax policy instruments, as you said, in pretty much all trade agreements we observe or we find the word tax incentive. What is it, in your opinion, the justification to keep using these tax incentives, even when the empirical evidence, and maybe not beside the empirical evidence, shows that they are not the most effective tool to do to get there? Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I have to be careful when I say these things. Uh, I don't care about empirical ev evidence. I'm. Um... Uh, what I wanted to say is that there is a clear link in the real world because policymakers do it. Now, um, they do it to attract investment. That doesn't mean that that works. 
but they do it in order to attract investment. And ultimately, then they have a tax policy in place that has other implications for their country. Um, so why is it happening? Um, I can actually see a lot of stickiness in, uh, I think, in policy making, even among experts. When you start doing a consultant starts doing a project on investment promotion, who has never done this before, what does he or she do? He or she looks at what do these promotion things look like elsewhere. And then you will see there are two things that appear everywhere, information on the processes for investment and information on tax incentives. So you start working on tax incentives. There are, Silly things like this are actually going on. There may also be lobbying, of course, by, uh, by certain players in the, um, in the economy. But if um, the, um, the empirical evidence shows there is no link, then uh, that uh, should, in my view, be, um, be used to support a move away from this kind of incentives. I, I, I mean to remember that the World Bank has already for some time been signaling this is of no use for you. But uh, we are seeing these practices in the developing world. You have seen an example from Namibia, and you have seen an example from Finland. We are seeing it in the industrialized world. We are seeing this in the richest countries of, um, of Europe. So um, it's maybe time to kill a myth. All right, wonderful. Marian, again, thank you so much for your remarks and for fielding all of those very excellent questions. Now we will move on to our second speaker and we will hear from Corey Hillier, who is Senior Counsel for Tax Law in the IMF's legal department. Corey works across a broad range of tax policy areas, including transfer pricing, digitalization, anti-avoidance, financial services, and also dispute resolution. He provides tax advice in the context of the IMF's technical assistance programs, as well as surveillance and financial assistance programs. And that includes the uh, Platform for Collaboration on Tax, which is an initiative between the IMF, also the OECD, the UN, and the World Bank. Previously, Corey practiced law in Australia, including at King and Wood Mallisons and Henry Davis York. Corey, we are very happy to have you here today and thanks to you as well. So the floor is now yours. Thank you so much for that, that introduction. Uh, and hopefully you can see my screen um, and hear my voice. I will say that I am grappling with a cold. Um, and so um, hopefully uh, my voice will hold up through the course of the presentation. Um, but, but I think my presentation is a good um, follow on from what we were just discussing, which was tax incentives for investment. Um, and so the purpose of my presentation is li a little bit to recap uh, the IMF's work um, with tax incentives and investment. Um, and so for those that have been following the work, there was a request, uh, well, the fund has been doing work in this space for a very long time, but there was a formal request by the G20 Development Working Group to, to come up with some guidance about um, designing tax incentives that are more effective and efficient, particularly for low income countries. Um, and so tax incentives were not part formally of, of the G20 or OECD BEPS project, but are a major concern in developing countries, particularly because uh, there's a large fiscal cost. Um, and as we've already discussed, if they're not effective in attracting investment, um, then they become counterproductive. Um, and so in 2015, the PCT um, produced a toolkit, which was IMF led, and of course the platform for collaboration on tax, the PCT is jointly established by the IMF, the OECD, the World Bank and the UN. Now my presentation is also going to touch on, on the topical aspects of tax incentives, um, and that is going forward the needed, need to consider the impact of the proposed global minimum tax on tax incentives. And, and as we heard, uh, the, the inclusive framework currently, in fact, as we're sitting here now, uh, is meeting to try and come up with some consensus on at least the high level principles that, that, that underpin that. But, but I thought this session would be a good one just to, to kind of stargaze a little bit to see what the impact of, of the proposal might be on tax incentives going forward. So let's start with a broad statement, which is the empirical evidence certainly does find that, that, that taxes matter for investment, um, although most likely less so for developing countries. And, and I'll explain a little bit why. So the toolkit 
uh, talks about the prevalence and trends in, in, in the proliferation of tax incentives uh, and their effectiveness and efficiency. And as I mentioned earlier, there's high fiscal costs and, and redundancy aspects uh, which really need to be addressed. And when we say redundancy, uh, that's, that's where investment would be taking place, even in the absence of, of the tax incentive. And so redundant tax incentives obviously lead to, to fiscal leakage. So the toolkit goes through the guidance with their use, both the design, the governance and evaluation post implementation, also the need for some international coordination, because as we've also heard, uh, tax incentives can induce race to the bottom. Um, and so some international coordination would help. And certainly what we're seeing uh, in the inclusive framework is, is, is a step towards that. Um, also, the toolkit also provides some practical tools for, for countries to be able to assess the effectiveness and efficiency of their tax incentives. So what do we mean by a tax incentive? Well, it's any special tax provision granted to qualified investment projects or firms that provide favourable deviations from the general tax code. So some type of preference compared to the baseline tax situation. If we look at the 1980s, and we just have that as the starting point, uh, there were tax holidays in 40% in of, of sub-Saharan Africa, but less than 200 economic zones uh, in 46 countries. And today we can see more than 80% have tax holidays and there's over 3,500 economic zones in, in 130 countries. So we can see the proliferation of tax incentives. Now, the, the high expectation that they generate investment uh, needs to be tempered. And what do we mean by that? Um, and this is the redundancy factor. So, so usually the uh, stated objective of a tax incentive is to attract investment or FDI. And of course, FDI is important for development. Um, and it certainly um, has positive spillovers um, in terms of both growth and productivity. But, but whether tax incentives matter, the, the research is, is, is split. And in fact, in, in most investor surveys, um, you, you find that many investors would have invested even without the incentive, thereby making the incentive redundant. If we see this graph here, and I think I can actually bring up my laser pointer. Um, if you look at this, it essentially um, tabulates the, the investment survey results and we see redundancy rates exceed 70 percent in, in 10 of the 14 surveys used. Um, and in fact, in Guinea, Rwanda, Tanzania and Uganda, you can see that more than 90 percent of investments based on investment surveys would have been made even without the incentive. So the bottom line really is you can't make up for weak conditions. And what do we mean by weak conditions? Uh, they're things that, that matter most um, or, or more potentially for investors in terms of their place of investment. And they're things like economic stability, political stability, infrastructure, rule of law. Uh, and, and this chart shows you, if I can just move my panel, that actually incentives um, are a lower order um, factor in, in making investment decisions. And certainly over the period that these investor surveys were taken, reducing in importance. And you can see things like the transparency of the legal framework actually increasing as well as political stability uh, and local markets, et cetera. So again, a couple of takeaways uh, is that Tax incentives may not matter for investments, particularly in, in, in low income countries. Um, and certainly there's, there's become less important uh, based on the investor survey over time. Now that doesn't mean there's not a role for tax incentives. Um, and so tax incentives will continue to play a role, um, but, but they need to be well designed in order to avoid this redundancy effect. Uh, and so cost-based incentives, and what do we mean by that? Things like accelerated depreciation are preferred over profit-based incentives and profit-based incentives as, as are things like tax holidays uh, and zero uh, profit tax rates on, on, on profits. Why are cost-based incentives preferred? It's because they lower the cost of capital and so may make borderline investments um, um, or, or investment projects that are, are, are um, profitable on the margins, more profitable and therefore likely to be undertaken in the absence of the 
the investment um, tax incentive. Why are profit-based incentives not preferred is because they typically make profitable investments more profitable. Um, and so if, if the investment was profitable to begin with, it's more likely to be made even in the absence of the tax incentive. Now, tax incentives, it's hard to, to, to generalize, of course, but typically if, if the, if, Typically, if an investor is looking to invest in a jurisdiction because there's some um, local characteristic, whether it be a natural resource, some characteristic of the market or, or some strategic asset such as know-how or technology in the jurisdiction, um, then those circumstances are likely lead to a situation where the investment would be undertaken even without the tax incentive. However, if the investor is, is seeking some type of efficiency gain, uh, then e FDI may be responsible to tax. And of course, as we've heard earlier, the international tax regime also plays a part. Um, and so profitable investments that are mobile tend to be sensitive to both uh, cost-based incentives as well as profit-based incentives, which leads me to the current system um, and how tax incentives feature within it. And so if we look at this diagram, um, we can see a typical structure. We have parent company with intermediate co one, intermediate co two, with some local investment being undertaken in the source or market country. And so if we think about the features of, of, of the current tax system uh, and particularly the weaknesses, uh, we see that capital emanates from the capital exporting country, and typically those countries have moved to a territorial system, uh, which means foreign sourced income typically is not taxed, which means uh, if local jurisdictions give a tax incentive, then the benefit could, could be retained. Then we have a situation where we set up intermediate holding structures and not necessarily always for tax reasons, but, but for other investment reasons that, that we've also heard things like bilateral investment treaties, but, but also tax does play a part. And the international norm is that foreign income in these individual entities are not taxed back at the headquarters until repatriated. And there's some anti-abuse rules that, that can disturb that norm, but essentially, you can accumulate foreign profits uh, without taxation back at the headquarters, which incentivizes uh, these entities being placed in, in, in low tax jurisdictions. Again, there are a number of features of, of the tax system which will make those jurisdictions more attractive than others. The one is again, those that operate on a territorial system or with participation exemptions there, you can sell shareholdings for low tax on both dividends and exit gains. Similarly, down here, you might have a jurisdiction with a tax incentive that, that, that is a preferential regime, uh, might be directed at something that's mobile, for instance, intellectual property. And here you can generate high residual profits um, at, at low tax rates. Uh, similarly, down here, uh, where typically you see low income countries or, or in fact any source countries uh, that use tax incentives, they can be inefficient and effective for, for the reasons I discussed. It can lead to a race to the bottom, uh, given um, um, the competition on, on incentives and rates. Also, even if the top jurisdiction um, decides to tax it, then it can actually, what's often described as, as an export of tax in the sense that the tax given up in the local source jurisdiction to the extent that the, the foreign income becomes taxable in the headquartered jurisdiction might actually, in a sense, result in a fiscal transfer from what would otherwise be collected by the source country to the residence country. Now, all of this essentially means that we have a system uh, where there is an incentive often to shift large residual profits into low tax jurisdictions uh, to the detriment of both the residence country because it either doesn't tax it um, or, or it's deferred until repatriated and to the source country because it incentivizes shifting profits out of that jurisdiction into the low tax jurisdiction. So essentially we have the proposal for the global minimum tax and that's to ensure that within that structure, 
uh, the business income is subject to at least some minimum level of taxation. And it works essentially on, on two rules. One is an outbound rule. Um, so that would be a rule that essentially attributes the profit back to parent co. The second is a source country rule, which essentially tries to tax it here at the local entity level. And uh, the global minimum tax has, has attractions because it reduces profit shifting and mitigates tax competition uh, because there is some minimum level of taxation um, on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. It's, it's a backstop to the current arrangements. And so uh, there's a modest need for coordination because some of these measures um, can be adopted unilaterally, uh, although there is benefit in coordination. Uh, developing countries would, would gain from a minimum on inbound, um, and many have already adopted inbound rules of their own, but there are challenges and issues, um, and that is that minimum taxes uh, can be blunt, um, and so they can disincentivize investment uh, and increase distortions, and so design becomes important. And there's also the question of at what rate should any minimum be set, and you will have seen at least 15% was the G7 commitment. So if we think about a little bit the, the diagram that, that I put forward earlier, which, which, which was the features and the weaknesses, how, how is that likely to be impacted by a global minimum tax? And so first of all, we have this idea of an outbound rule where the residual profit that's lightly taxed below the minimum is attributed back to the headquartered jurisdiction. We can see that that strengthens worldwide taxation. Uh, and the proposal is for it to apply on a country by country basis. When we look at this next box, a, 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 and this box is really a holding jurisdiction, so FDI flows through and out. Um, and so we can see the minimum tax, this jurisdiction might have a feature which essentially exempts the, the, the exit gain or the intragroup dividend, which is common uh, feature of, of, of many tax systems with participation exemptions, then the, the zero tax paid on the exit gain and the intergroup dividend is unlikely to be disturbed by the global minimum tax. Uh, and that's because there are various adjustments to, to remove that from the tax base. So going forward, there will be a continued need to, to, to reinforce source taxation, particularly where this gain is attributable to things like immovable property in the local jurisdiction. Um, because the minimum tax won't essentially apply or buy it at this level. This entity here, which you might recall I, I said was the absorber or the recipient of, of large residual profits being shifted, maybe because there's some favorable intellectual property IP box regime, um, or for whatever reason, um, there's large profits that are lightly taxed, then this is the box that the global minimum tax is, is, is designed to to get at. And so there might be an incentive to raise effective tax rates because if this jurisdiction um, or this jurisdiction for that matter was to collect the, the top up tax um, above, um, below the minimum under the global minimum tax, then you can see there's an incentive for this jurisdiction to, to, to raise their rate to avoid the transfer to the headquartered jurisdiction or the local host jurisdiction. Now, of course, it's not as simple as that because the proposal has uh, many adjustments, modifications, carve outs. And so one is the substance based carve out, which will essentially preserve some tax incentives, particularly over what we call routine profits uh, at this level, which is why there's, there's a proposal particularly by the US to, to, to remove that carve out and essentially make it combat um, tax competition more, more comprehensively. Also cost-based incentives, which we favored in the toolkit, uh, will be preserved through, through modifications. And typically they give rise to timing differences rather than permanent differences, but it will unwind the benefit over residual profits, particularly large residual profits attributable to things like IP regime. So again, possible trend towards alternative minimum or increasing uh, effective tax rates um, for this jurisdiction to avoid the fiscal transfer. Lastly, if we look down here, which is really where low income countries sit or, or, or other source countries, uh, then again, um, tax incentives will still be relevant going forward because of the, the limited impact of the global minimum tax over routine 
profits. And that's of course because of the substance-based carve out. So incentives directed at, at essentially manufacturing and things that generate fairly routine returns are unlikely to be impacted by the global minimum tax. Also cost-based incentives uh, will, be modif will be adjusted for, and so they'll be preserved. Also the threshold for the global minimum tax is high. And so for m and &E groups with revenue below 750 million euros, they'll be outside the scope of the global minimum tax, which means um, 80 to 90% based on OECD estimates are outside the scope of the minimum tax, which means tax incentives for the vast majority of corporates um, will still be relevant um, and able to, to uh, be implemented, which again makes the design important back to the PCT toolkit. Now, the global minimum tax also does benefit low-income countries in the sense that there's now a disincentive also for them, like the Haven, uh, to lower tax rates below the minimum, again, because of the transfer or the top-up tax that would be paid in another jurisdiction. But we also need to ensure that the ability of low-income countries to enforce their tax rates above the minimum, which many have, um, are not impacted by the design of the rules themselves. And, and so I just note the proposed US shield there, which, which essentially allows um, or incentivize others to adopt the global minimum tax as well. The last box that I left out was this inversion risk. And I left it out because it's the more complicated one, but, but, but essentially um, if this entity um, became the parent company, for instance, and so often you hear about inversion risks um, being talked about in the context of the proposed um, global minimum tax. If, if this entity were to become the headquartered jurisdiction and it became a non-adopter of the minimum tax, then it is possible um, for that entity to the extent that it's making or it's booking the profits uh, in respect of unrelated party transactions or even related, related party transactions um, undertaken remotely may avoid the impact of the global minimum tax, which, which is why, again, I noted the US shield, which uh, essentially incentivizes others to adopt, including acting as, as a protection measure or an integrity measure against this, this type of inversion risk. Lastly, I would say that um, regional coordination uh, and the toolkit goes into this uh, will still be important. The global minimum tax, of course, helps um, in the sense of unwinding some of the benefits of, of tax incentives over uh, residual profits. But given routine profits, we, we, we'll still be able to be subject to tax incentives. There's, there's still the ongoing um, idea that some type of coordination on tax incentives will be important, again, to stop the race to the bottom on these out of scope incentives. And that cooperation uh, has been difficult to achieve historically, but, but certainly can, some improvements can be made on, on both cooperation on data and reporting across jurisdictions. So I'll leave it there. Uh, and turn to any questions. Hey, Corey, thank you so much for that extremely interesting presentation. I especially appreciated your statistics on um, the redundancy of some of these incentives. So as Corey had mentioned, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A box below. Um, but we do have a question for you from Stephen Shea. And he would like to know whether the IMF has evaluated the effect of pillar two on patent boxes in developed countries. Um, will it be equivalent to the impact on investment incentives in developing countries? Thank you for that question. And so uh, I think it's all a little bit new and evolving. And so the IMF is continuing to do work, but, but, but hasn't finalized um, any output, but, but particularly on the, the IP regimes. I would say um, going through that, that presentation and, and, and thinking about it a little bit more deeply, uh, it seems like to the extent the IP regime um, attracts large residual profits, which I guess is the point of, of, of the regime itself, that, that then it is likely to be uh, more heavily impacted by the global minimum tax. Of course, the original blueprint, the expectation was that the minimum tax rate would be somewhere between nine and 12 and a half. And we now see 
the G7 commitment to something of at least 15. And so the at least 15, which is higher than the original expectation, has, has reopened debates around the substance-based carve-out, which of course is important for the IP regime because um, uh, one um, aspect of IP regimes, like all um, tax incentives, um, is to ensure that there's appropriate substance in the jurisdiction so that the incentive is not harmful um, based on that OECD standard. Um, and so it has really opened the debate about to what what the size of that carve out needs to be. And so the greater the carve out, of course, the less impact on the IP regimes of the advanced countries. But, but as a general point, I would say that, that the minimum tax would bite those regimes to the extent they're successful in attracting large residual profits. Uh, for, for low income countries, I think the, 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 the impact is, is, is a bit less. Um, and in fact, probably much less for, for the reasons that I explained, which is the threshold is high. Um, and so incentives will continue for all groups outside the threshold. Uh, also the substance-based carve out, typically low income countries attract um, um, what is more routine activity and routine returns. Um, and so to the extent that, that the minimum tax doesn't bite um, on the incentive that's granted over those types of profits, that, that then again, it's probably gonna have a lesser impact but 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 the imf certainly is is looking at all of these things but these are a bit of our kind of preliminary considerations um based on the design of the package that that is evolving even as we speak okay thank you for that um next we'll move to Augustine. i believe he has a question for you yes thanks nana uh, thanks Corey. great presentation i i like it very much so um, I'm aware of that study coming from the World Bank, um, where you show the re strikingly high, by the way, um, redundancy ratios for investment incentives, tax incentives in many developing countries. And um, I keep using those numbers when I do work uh, in this field, but those numbers are based on a survey with very pretty old data, right? 2011. And we keep using that because the lack of data when it comes to tax incentives is just striking worldwide. And even more so uh, the lack of um, data regarding impact evaluations, cost benefit analysis, really difficult to get a full picture of the lack of effectiveness of these tax incentives across the world. That's why we keep referring to that survey, right? Which is informative, but it's also limited in, in a sense. So what is the work that the IMF is doing to try to improve uh, that, that situation and to get more data, better data when it comes to not only evaluations, ideally that's where we should be getting, but in the first stage, when it comes to reporting and estimating um, the, the cost, the fiscal cost of tax expenditures uh, worldwide. So I think the the toolkit was the kind of last collective effort to, to, to focus on tax incentives. Um, but, but, but I would say that the IMF continues in, in bilateral kind of technical assistance in countries to, to, to evaluate the, the cost and effectiveness of tax incentives. And so we are using those TA projects to gather the data to be able to do further work um, that's collective. And so there's some talk of, again, um, once the, the dust settles on, on the global minimum tax, wherever that lands, um, to reinvigorate the work on tax incentives, given they're likely to be relevant going forward. Um, I would say that, that I'm from the legal department, and so I'm a, a tax lawyer, um, and so not an economist. And so certainly I'm familiar with the work that my colleagues are doing, but, but, but certainly they're the ones that, that, that do more the kind of analytical slash data um, work. Um, and so um, my understanding is that we'll continue to do it um, and there will be a refresh, but is that exactly when um, it would be soon? But, but I think we're, we're waiting for the dust to settle on, on the, 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 the consensus that, that, that hopefully will be reached. Now, uh, Joy in Dubai has her hand up, so I will give the floor to you to ask your question. Thanks, Nana. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. That was a really interesting presentation. I'm just curious, um, you know, despite what we say about tax incentives and how undesirable they are, 
and despite the you know the momentum in discussing the, the minimum tax and hopefully adopting a minimum tax um, developing countries, particularly African countries, still continue to introduce new incentives. So most recently, Rwanda just revised their investment regime, and they've introduced a preferential rate of 0% on corporate income tax. But they've also added some interesting things. They've done VAT exemptions. They've also introduced zero rating for VAT for purchase of goods and services within the country. So that's for foreign investors. And they also have PIT exemptions. And Kenya has also equally introduced a very extensive incentive regime for Japanese um, investors, which also includes similar VAT uh, and payee exemptions as well. So I'm just curious to hear from you, you know, despite all these developments, uh, does it look like there's a shift towards other aspects of taxation and how do we address that shift? Sorry, can you hear me? Um, uh, it, 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 when you say a shift to other aspects of taxation, so so you're right that the toolkit really focuses on on corporate income taxation, uh, and so I would say the the, the one uh, positive development that we've seen since the production of the toolkit is that most countries now um, on their new tax incentive design, and, and as I said, tax incentives still have a, a role to play, particularly in attracting investment, but, but more often than not, we are seeing countries design them that are more cost-based. Um, and so things like accelerated depreciation rather than tax holidays and profit-based incentives. Of course, we also see the shift and, and the transition that you mentioned um, in other areas like VAT, for instance. And so if we just take that as an example, that tends to be one where these types of incentives aren't particularly effective. Um, and, and the reason, of course, is it's a very different tax um, and it's not designed to stick with, with the business or the investor. In fact, it's designed to stick with the end consumer. Now, there, there may be circumstances where the VAT needs to be modified because it's not functioning properly. And, and sometimes countries um, are delayed giving refunds for, for things like um, VAT credits. Um, and so then they resort to doing some type of uh, deviation from what would be standard practice to, 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 to avoid the need to give a refund and so either zero rate or, or, or um, give an exemption depending on how the system works. Um, but, 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 but similarly, um, you, you know, these types of taxes and, and that transition that you talked about, you, uh, depending on the nature of the tax is probably an unwelcome development. Um, and so the IMF certainly in our technical assistance uh, looks at every category um, of tax and particularly the, 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 the quirks of the system uh, and certainly would give recommendations to unwind the ones um, that, that probably aren't effective and in fact will complicate the system with, with very little benefit. Thank you, Corey. Um, we have a question for you from Sudarshan in the chat. His question is, many tax treaties still consist of tax sparing credits. Do you see a proliferation of tax sparing credit clauses being negotiated more in tax agreements going forward as an incentive feature? Well, tax sparing is, is, is an interesting one. I, I mean, there are a number of I think old treaties that that still have them. Um, I, I would say, well, certainly my understanding is 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 the trend is 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 certainly uh, reduced uh, in the number of treaties that that have tax bearing. And I think the reason for that is that um, it's it's noted in the UN uh, model convention, but 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 not in the OECD one. And, and certainly my experience having developed the PCT toolkit on, on tax treaties, uh, the OECD position um, is that they don't support tax bearing. Um, and certainly um, the US has a very notable position where um, it would never agree to tax bearing. Um, and so if you have a collection of, of developed countries um, and advanced ones that are unlikely to give the benefit of that type of provision, then naturally it explains the, the trend to not see them included in, in recently negotiated treaties. However, uh, you do raise a good point that, that it does kind of, again, re-raise its relevance going forward 
particularly in the context of, of, of a global minimum tax where, where certain tax incentives may be by design preserved um, and they're more likely to be adopted in low income countries. And so if that is the, the design of the minimum tax to preserve these types of incentives, uh, it does raise the question of, of, of whether um, the capital uh, exporting country should, should preserve the incentive through the, the tax treaty through, through, through tax bearing. Uh, and so maybe this will be another thing that that gets reactivated or, or redebated as a result of the global minimum tax. But but it would require, I think, to my mind, uh, 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 revisiting by the OECD um, on the formal position with respect to that provision, because to the extent it doesn't find its way, even as an alternative in the model convention, then then it's hard to see that the take up is is, is going to be widespread. Thank you. Now we're going to have two final questions for you. So one is from Juliana Gonzalez. She had her hand up, so I will give her the floor. Okay. Thank you, Corey, for your excellent presentation. My question is about regional cooperation. At the end of your presentation, we're saying that basically it's more intended to have not constraining, but more hard law type of institutions, kind of like state aid, you mentioned it opposite to more like general or soft law based uh, in like ideas. However, in developing countries, especially in Latin America, we see that uh, normally they're being really influenced by these standards, specifically, Irma mentioned it before, they adopt a lot of like good governance and standards based or used in Europe through investment uh, treaties. So what would you think like if this helps the countries to actually gain regional cooperation or it will be more kind of like an influence directly from non-regional uh, partners like EU based to, to developing countries or Latin America? I, I, I think it's probably a, a combination of both. Um, I, I would say that in the tax incentive space that the, the reason why regional coordination hasn't been that successful um, is because of that lack of enforcement mechanism. I, I mean, if you look at the, the global system um, and particularly the forum of harmful tax practices, again, it, it's more a soft law kind of agreement or standard, but, but, but it's peer reviewed, which, which, which can then have consequences. And so again, if you look at the EU list, I think um, that, that, that initiative was um, uh, enough to influence the, the, the impact on, on jurisdictions outside the EU and outside the OECD membership. And so to kind of answer your last question first is that I certainly can see going forward the impact um, of actors outside the regional grouping impacting the regional grouping. Um, but, but, but that doesn't take away from the fact that the regional groupings themselves um, could get together. And again, maybe there's some type of um, heads of agreement or, or code of conduct um, similar again to, to, to the EU where, where countries get together um, and, and agree on things like the design of internal tax incentives to ensure that there isn't this kind of competition which has historically uh, led to the fiscal leakage and, and what everyone describes as, as the race to the bottom. So I think it can be a combination of both, but, but, but obviously the internal um, influence would be preferable over the external one because often the external one comes um, as a bit of a, a stick um, and, and can often get many developing countries tied up in, in knots about um, assessments being made um, by others um, and, and it can really distract them from the core task, whether it be tax reform for VAT, which we talked about earlier, um, or PIT, rather than trying to reform their international tax rules to meet the standards uh, developed and imposed by those outside the grouping. Thank you, Corey. And we have a question from Frederick here. He says that assuming that countries adopt pillar two without substance-based carve-outs like the US may do, would it make sense to carve out least developed countries so that these would be permitted to gain a competitive advantage over more developed countries that would be subject to pillar two? 
Yeah, I think this is a, a really interesting idea. And, and again, um, it's one that's, that's borrowed a little bit from the trade space. So my present presentation obviously talked about tax and investment, but, and, but, but trade is a big aspect. And so certainly you can carve out more easily under um, WTO rules, particularly for least developed countries. And so this idea is, is, is coming in in the context of, of Pillar 2. Um, uh, I think it's, it, it is an interesting idea. Um, but, but, but I think the way the rules have been designed, essentially the incentives that least developed countries would be seeking to implement are probably unaffected by the minimum tax. And so I think maybe on first blush, it's, 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 it's unnecessary. Um, but, 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 but and so the carve out would apply for, for two relevant factors. One is um, the, 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 well, I, uh, I guess taking your first question is on the substance-based carve-out, sorry, which, which, which I didn't address. Um, and, and so let's say the substance-based carve-out was removed, then everybody would be affected by the, the, um, the, 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 the global minimum tax. And so that does yeah, raise the relevance for, for, for certain types of exceptions. Um, but, but, but at the end of the day, um, I think a global minimum tax certainly allows or benefits everyone, both both directly and indirectly, and certainly low-income countries by having a global minimum tax um, certainly will reduce the pressure to 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 um, combat profit shifting. Will also reduce the pressure on the system with respect to tax competition, which essentially might allow them to recalibrate their tax system in other ways rather than offering incentives. And so I'm thinking about, um, you know, a more uniform rate system, uh, maybe even a broader base, but, but, but with a lower rate system, uh, maybe this is a direct benefit, which, which would obviate the need to have these express carve outs for, for, for low income countries, but, but certainly it's an idea that has been um, re-injected into the bait and, and borrowed to some extent from the trade law area. Wonderful, Corey, again, thank you so much for the excellent presentation and everyone, thank you for your really, really good questions, really great discussion there. Now I am very happy to introduce Suranjali Tandon, who is an assistant professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy in New Delhi. Her research areas are international taxation, sustainable finance, and her current research focuses on digital taxation, corporate taxation, green finance, and financial markets. She has written several papers on these topics as they pertain to India, and she was a Chevening uh, Financial Services Fellow at King's College in London. So Saranjali, we are very grateful to have you here today. Thank you, and the floor is now yours. Thank you, Nala. Uh, thanks uh, to Irma and the organizers for organizing this, because um, in my former life, as I call it, as a PhD student, uh, my core area of expertise was international trade and uh, during that time I was intrigued by the interactions that tax has with trade and investment and uh, perhaps that might have been my uh, road into ta international taxation. So today I'm going to focus uh, first at a more broad level discussion on you know existential questions of incentives and then uh, use India as sort of a case study for, uh, you know, how do we look at incentives? Do they still, should they still exist? And uh, what is the way forward? So I'll start with my uh, first slide. Uh, next slide, please. Which gives you an intuitive sense uh, to all those who have not looked at this before or not at least try to mull over it. Uh, taxes and investment are related, I would say, bi-causally in the sense that uh, tax can impact the return that is earned on this investment and definitely uh, impact behavior, uh, in, if not in totality, but in parts uh, of the investor on what his decision should be to invest in the next period or in the jurisdiction. And of course, uh, there is now a new and emerging literature to say that you know, investment can influence your tax system as well. And uh, maybe perhaps towards the end of my presentation, I'll, I'll talk about this literature more in detail. But that's really where we say that you know there is 
great deal of interaction between investment and tax, and it cannot be ignored, uh, which Maureen has also talked about in her, her in her first presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, Corey has already sort of spoken about uh, the relationship between investment and tax in not too much in detail, but uh, the, the jury is still out there. I mean, we, we, we still not settled on an answer. Uh, every year there are new research projects sanctioned just to look at this issue again. And, and, and that kind of hints to the fact that we, we haven't found the final answer. And so I've listed some of the key studies which were like a meta-analysis, which is to say, take results of all studies and combine and see, okay, what is the elasticity of investment to tax rate changes? And you, know, you look at OECD finds that there is in fact an inverse relationship. That is if tax rates increase, your FDI goes down. Then IMF says that, okay, look, investments, not all investments, uh, if you look at foreign investments, perhaps, private domestic investments, maybe not, there isn't, a, there isn't an impact. And uh, one of the gold standards in this sort of space is the Muijian Edwin paper, which again looks at elasticities and says that, you know, well where cost of capital is of greater concern, it could have an impact. And as UN also sort of iterates. But, but I think uh, the, the, the core way of examining tax incentives is by looking at a counterfactual, which I've also heard from many uh, investment lobbies that, you know, we wouldn't have invested this little had there been any certainty or had, had the tax rates not been so high. And so to construct that counterfactual to say what the investments would have been had there been no incentives is the way to sort of, sort of show what the relationship is. And, and I think Corey's presentation was interesting and um, I, I seem to have missed that study, but I think that's one way to look at it, to survey, to say that, you know, what is the counterfactual? So I would say that uh, even though that study exists, uh, we still are not sure. And perhaps the lack of surety comes from the fact that there could be some incentives that work better than the others, or uh, there are certain circumstances in which certain incentives work better. And so therefore there needs to be recalibration every few years. Uh, but I'm not going to sort of allude to that now, maybe later towards the later part of my uh, presentation. Next slide, please. Um, I would say that we all stop at investment, uh, but the, the last missing piece of the puzzle, which I have been trying to solve in my uh, work is to step it up and take it to growth. Because ultimately, what do we want investment to do? To step up the rates of economic growth in, in, in a jurisdiction, right? And that becomes very, very tenuous. Uh, there are mostly correlations. I mean, I will talk about my own work wherein you know to draw that link became really difficult because granular data is not available, especially for developing countries. But I think this entire chain of impact is very important because putting investments just in a stock market does not automatically result in higher economic growth. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so well, uh, we know that people have a strong dislike, and this is a quote from Richard Bird, uh, who's no more between us, but I think uh, stalwart in tax. And you can see the disdain for tax incentives there in the court, uh, you know, saying that these may not be effective. But irrespective of the dislike, uh, what we see now is that they continue. And they continue in different forms in different countries. And I will show you in the next slide and how they do continue. The UN sort of makes the interesting case to say that you know, perhaps they could be like a life cycle of kinds of incentives that exist. So developed countries could do more like investment credits or depreciation allowances, whereas developing countries would you know, look for special economic zones or tax holidays or you know, regional in investment incentives. And when I'll talk about India, I'll show what the context of introducing each of these incentives was. So uh, in sum from this slide, it, it is that you know, we, we do step back and think every couple of years about what tax incentives can, cannot do, and whether they're good or bad. Uh, there's mixed evidence, but you know, despite the dislike, they, they still uh, continue. Next slide, please. So this is a snapshot. Uh, uh, you know, my apologies, it's a little dated, but it, it gives you a sense of what kind of tax incentives exist around the world. And, uh, you know, just looking at the regional comparison, uh, you get a sense that the OECD countries have uh, preference for investment allowances or a VAT uh, reduction 
or, or, or you know, R&D deductions. Whereas uh, if you look at countries in East Asia, or whether you look at countries in Latin America, they're more dispersed. It could be you know, tax holidays, tax exemptions. Uh, you know, they could be SEZ and uh, free, free, free zones. So I think there is some sort of uh, argument uh, for, to be made in terms of the life cycle of incentives, as in at what stage a country is in terms of development and what are the incentives that they offer, there might be a correlation there. But uh, I think another reinforcing fact from this table is that, you know, we're all in the same game. Different countries are doing playing it differently, right? So the OECD still prefers certain kind of incentives and, and the rest of the world prefers uh, their own kind and they continue to exist. Next slide, please. provocative here uh, because I want to go back and ask what exactly are investments and what exactly are incentives to in, in, uh, investment, right? Now, um, we, we, we tend to focus a lot on international tax, but I think it's also important to step back and look at domestic tax systems and see why an incentive was there, which I've already sort of alluded to uh, in the last uh, slide. The second one, of course, which was also raised in a question in terms of, you know, sparing provisions, etc. Uh, what happens when you have a withholding rate or an exemption of a certain kind of income within a tax treaty that is also an exemption uh, with of obviously a different purpose, which is to attract foreign investment. The last two are, are, are sort of provocative to say that, you know, let's say there's a new dispute resolution system in Pillar 1, right? Now that offers certainty and that offers binding uh, judgments and, you know, for the rest of the economy, that's not available. So is it, is, is it an incentive? Right? There are also one time tax settlements, and India experimented with this last year, wherein, you know, uh, they offer to the taxpayer that you know, come forward and uh, settle the dispute with us without the interest or the level of interest or penalty. And I would say that is also an incentive to sort of get out of the system and finalize the deal. So, so the, the uh, special provisions in any which way could be those, could be incentives, right? The last one, uh, anti-abuse provisions, I thought of this while I was looking back at my work on uh, the multilateral instrument. And uh, if you look at Article 6 and 7, which was, uh, I suppose, to do with treaty abuse, different countries adopted di different positions, right? And the classic case was India-Mauritius Treaty. It was out. There was a S, uh, uh, special LOB, which was signed through the amending protocol, which was applicable, but, uh, you know, for other countries, it's PPT. So, uh, some countries, investment from some countries are uh, subject to higher standards, as you may say, of anti avoidance bills other than all. So uh, I feel, you know, you can interpret incentives in so many which ways and can, can be offered in so many different ways. Uh, uh, it's always a catch-up game uh, that, that regulators play with uh, in terms of tweaking the tax laws. And of course, uh, if you think about investment, as I talked about in the IMF paper, the distinction was drawn between private, domestic, and then there is foreign investment. And I think within that as well, all this, also there's a question of passive investment and active investment. So would you want more uh, shares to be bought in securities market, or would you want fresh acquisitions or greenfield investment? So uh, I think the question can be asked in so many which ways. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, moving from an international or general context, I come to India's experience, and I have selected three quotes uh, from very different periods in India's economic history uh, on tax incentives. And if you look at 1963-64, which is exactly when, you know, a few years down the line from our independence, uh, the finance minister says that, look, uh, we need to industrialize. And so therefore, he gave a 10% rebate on corporate taxes. And this was a time when trade policy was actually inward looking. It was a period of restriction. Foreign companies were not allowed to function in India. And these are the sort of incentives that were sort of offered. So they wanted companies to invest in other companies or plow back their profits and grow. Uh, we moved many, many years later and we reached the 1990s, which is when India liberalized, right? So now its foreign currency is allowed to fluctuate, of course, in a bank and current account is convertible and capital account is partially convertible. And the finance minister now is worried that, you know, offshore funds are not able to locate in India. So 
fine. We're going to give them incentives to invest in India. And this came in the form of a slew of incentives. It was, you know, how to treat equity preferably, uh, the long-term capital gains, dividend tax, et cetera, were different uh, for equity and especially for foreign investors. We have two categories. One is direct investment and portfolio investment. And portfolio investment are the short-term investors and they too receive benefits. Fast forward now to 2019-20. Uh, you know, the finance minister announces that there should be tax benefits to a special economic zone that we have created for financial services called the International Financial Services Center. And there again, capital gains on specific structures and instruments are exempt. So it really says that, uh, you know, tax policy tags along with your economic policy or overall economic objective and these incentives change their shape and form. But uh, you can't wish them away quite easily, especially in the case of developing countries like India. Next slide, please. So what, do, what exists at the moment? In fact, interestingly, recently in the Income Tax Act, uh, as I'd already mentioned, uh, there were special incentives given to the IFSC. And in my sense, it is also a way of compensating for the regulatory requirements that are, uh, are applicable to anyone investing in India in the onshore market. Uh, then India has a long-term strat strategy to sort of develop infrastructure. And so therefore special carve-outs were made for sovereign wealth funds from specific countries uh, to alternate investment funds. And of course, uh, the preferential treatment to equity investments continues. Uh, so there is a strangely in capital gains there is a uh, equity bias so uh, as of today we still have those incentives next slide please okay so, um this is to give you a sense of what are the numbers right um sorry for not including the unit sets in in, in inr uh mil million close to million <laughs> So if you look at the uh, proportions, accelerated depreciation is actually the highest uh, uh, form of, or the largest exemption that, or incentive that uh, corporates claim, followed by SEZs, and then by R&D. And back in 2016, the government took it upon itself, or rather in 2015, took it upon itself to evaluate these incentives. So they, do they still uh, hold any importance, or should they be sort of done away with? And in this context, I sort of undertook an economic study to establish whether, whether or whether they do not uh, impact investment and economic growth. And um, I'm not saying anything new by saying that we can't establish it very clearly. But of course, uh, what we see is that there is a growth in economic activity during the introduction of these incentives, but to correlate it to these incentives is a little difficult. Another interesting sort of question that I pose when I say that, okay, these incentives perhaps may not be working, should we do away with them? Now, one of the big incentives offered, if you look at the yellow uh, part of the bar, is the, that to power sector. Now, uh, the power sector in India has its own sort of woes. Uh, it accounts for a large fraction of non-performing loans in India. So if today these incentives were to go, uh, are we staring at a banking problem? And, and, and for an economist, uh, you have to sit and think of these trade-offs. Uh, just to simply wave your hand and say it's all about taxes would be, I think, a wrong approach. So again, okay, this is a question to say that we need to sort of a full macroeconomic uh, analysis to say whether this is useful, whether should we get rid of it, and, and what are then the linkages uh, with, with, with other segments in the economy. Next slide, please. Okay. Having said that incentives exist and uh, uh, they're, they're, they're doing their, their bit in the economy, uh, India sort of moved on and said that, okay, we'll put sunset clause on uh, some of these uh, you know, tax incentives, such as the SEZ. And what we observe is interesting. So as a proportion of the revenue foregone, which is the total estimation of tax incentives given to corporates, and the percentage of total corporate tax collection goes down, the effective corporate tax rate reported sort of bumps up a little bit. I mean, there is a little bit of volatility in there because there were other economic shocks. But of course, you see that the effective tax rate goes up. And if you select the top companies in India, the, 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 the graph is steeper. So uh, in the end, I would say that, well, uh, 
reducing or at least rationalizing exemptions could be a great way. Uh, this was in fact done if, at the same time as corporate tax rates were brought down. So it was to say that we eliminate incentives and broadly bring down the rates. Now this also caused a little bit of furor amongst the foreign investors because branch profits were taxed at a higher rate uh, than domestic tax rates of 25% uh, to an Indian company. Now, again, that wedge is drawn. So what ultimately uh, is the question is that what is the economic basis for introducing this incentive and, and, and whether this serves your revenue purpose? Next slide, please. Okay, uh, the other one that we've heard way too many times uh, in India's context is the, the, the revolving door of Mauritius. So uh, a lot of money would sort of uh, enter through Mauritius, but not actually owned by Mauritian investors. And uh, to plug this, um, the government had signed the amending protocols to Singapore and uh, Mauritian Treaty. And what I've compiled here is quarterly um, statistics on the FDI inflows into India. Well, of course, uh, it's a little hard to read between quarterly statistics, but what we can see is that right after 2018 Jan, uh, you know, uh, this became applicable in the in 2018 after March, and so therefore you see some dip in the share of Mauritius, and uh, you see some dip in the share of of Singapore. So I'm just making a conjecture here, and I mean again, uh, this is subject to a lot of caveats, but there is some relationship there. And at this point, I just want to point out that you know. Uh, we may think of FDI and FPI as, as just investment into a country for corporate activity. But as someone who's worked on international trade and investment, I uh, I think there's a missing link that we'd never look at, which is the exchange rate impact of portfolio uh, investments. These are a serious uh, source of shock to foreign exchange uh, in developing economies. And for example, India holds up its current account balance through uh, the investment uh, inflows. So in a sense, these bilaterally negotiated relationships are uh, counterbalance such impact perhaps, uh, but of course should not be subject to abuse. Uh, like I here apply. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, one is tax rates and you know tax incentives, but then there's this another animal called tax certainty. And uh, this is something that the IMF has been working on for quite some time. The Platform for Collaboration put out their report, interesting report which surveys businesses about how they think of taxes. And if you look at this graph, uh, you know, you see, they, they look at different metrics and how they rank. And uh, it seems that overall tax environment affects uh, a great deal of countries, right? And what is tax certainty again? Like, is it for administration? It is for taxpayers, but definitely it uh, it seems to be uh, pinching businesses uh, in terms of the investment decisions or the location decisions, right? So um, I would say this is another element that needs to be looked at when you when you try to assess relationship between investment and tax. Next slide, please. And what is the source of tax certainty? So uh, uncertainty. So mostly the uncertainty is attributed to dispute resolution wherein you know cases are pending for very long, or the decisions are you know made in favor of uh, let's say the SSE, but after many years, or not in favor of the SSE in most cases. And uh, you know I've been working on dispute resolution for quite some time, and and I, and I put this graph here. Uh, this sort of a tentative graph for a small set of companies. But if you look at the share of disputed tax and corporate tax, it's, it's sort of gone up after 2015, right? So which means that part of the firm's revenue is locked in disputes and, and therefore is a cause of uncertainty, which could sort of then have a lead on impact on investment. Uh, India has one of the highest number of transfer pricing audits. Uh, my study, which looks at 7,000 cases of transfer pricing uh, in India, finds that the win rate is actually really poor for the tax department saying that, you know, then to question what are these audits really doing? Is it just pulling taxpayers out? And then this could again uh, adversely impact investment. Of course, uh, uh, no a presentation on investment and tax is complete without the reference to Vodafone and K, uh, two cases which have preoccupied us in many, many different ways. But I think this has raised very important questions for tax and investment at the same time. 
for example, how far back do you go back, go to check source of an income? Uh, you know, what do you call expropriation? I think all these questions are something that we should look to answer than just focus on the on the case alone. And uh, the other striking figure that I have for you um, is that you know there are four point three four trillion rupee INR which is locked in dispute as as against five point five seven trillion of tax revenues now. Of course, this, this, this uh, disputed amount is the backlog from previous years. The government is trying to definitely address this through settlement schemes, but uh, you know the state is a little uh, uncertain for businesses. So, what do you do then? You know, you have APAs and advanced rulings. And perhaps is one answer to say that investments can be encouraged by offering certainty and sort of moving tax out of that equation or uh, factors that affect the decision. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna. Those are a lot of concluding thoughts, but I'm just gonna quickly sort of, you know, look at them and, you know, leave you with questions, and you perhaps we can discuss this later. The first one is really going back to you know Warren's presentation to say that subsidies were sort of moved out of uh, the Rian's possibility because of the WTO, and so therefore, what small developing countries might be left with is really the tool of of taxation. And uh, you know, often and often a lot we, we talk about changing other regulatory practices in in developing countries, and especially labor law, which I find uh, very surprising because you know what what is to be changed in the labor law needs to be spelled out as clearly. So, for example, in India, the growth has been accompanied by contractualization of labor, and 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 okay, that might be a great thing for business. That might be a great thing because you have to pay lower wages, but is that a great thing for you know taxes because you can't find these people in your system so so uh, i think uh, you know when we talk about uh, improving other regulations and getting rid of tax incentives uh, there needs to be clarity in what other regulations can do uh, the third one of course uh, relates to this to say that tax is the pacifier to say that you know okay there's there are so many things wrong in terms of regulation or institutions and tax makes up for it and some countries cannot move ahead very fast in terms of the legislative processes. And so therefore tax is the only uh, quick resort. Uh, while reading, you know, all of this discussion on minimum taxes and, uh, you know, generally on, on, on international tax, I'm sort of reminiscing the capital control uh, discussion in the IMF. I mean, uh, there was an initial position that capital controls aren't good. And then we had to revisit them and say, no, maybe they're required. And, a lot of countries already had capital controls, and uh, you know, including India, where capital inflows are regulated, there are caps. And then, what do you have in the conventional thinking of uh, of international finance? What do you have as a tool uh, to influence the inflows which you require for your balance of payments? And I guess tax is is the loan standing tool that maybe will be maybe not to India but to many many other countries. And of course, no incentive is uh, is uh, immune to abuse, or it's not immune to innovations, as we call them in finance. The recent example of uh, SPACs, you know, uh, taking the place of IPOs, uh, is a classic uh, example of how you can structure in so many different ways to get around the problem of, uh, you know, being caught. Uh, you can create so many drop-down entities and uh, avail the benefits. Will minimum tax answer this question? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. And of course, uh, an interesting strand of literature that's developed recently is that institution, uh, sorry, in, investors can influence inst institutions. And, and I would really recommend reading Danzman and Slatskin's paper, which is that, you know, there's a great deal of lobbying and there's, there, there's need for coordination because those setting the rules for taxes never really talk to those setting the rules on trade and investment, and they're almost at a conflict. And to resolve this conflict, I think, so you're not just international coordination, I think uh, within the nation, there needs to be coordination between departments on what is the coherent economic uh, policy. But of course, I would say that uh, for any investment, retrospective action and a better dispute resolution mechanism uh, definitely works uh, better in terms of uh, bringing investment and perhaps could be an incentive. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, if anyone has any questions, please keep
But Angeli, that was such a fascinating presentation. Thank you so much for that and your excellent analysis. I think you left us with a lot of um, questions to think about. So along those lines, Augustine has a question for you. So I will give the floor to him. Thank you, Nana. Uh, thanks, uh, Suranjali. So, um, so I think Marion mentioned um, the theory of taxation I mean, from an optimal perspe perspective and how one should think about taxing immobile factors more than mobile factors, right? And I was wondering, and also uh, given that uh, some countries in Asia in particular are strong in, when it comes to services and how the impact of the pandemic could be a game changer there. And what I have in mind is the fact that many people are moving into remote, full remote modes of working and how that would have an impact in you know, increasing the mobility of labor as a factor uh, and whether we will be seeing some also tax competition, not only when it comes to business and corporations, but also when it comes to workers, basically to labor, right? There was some discussion about the mobility of uh, the wealthy and wealth taxation, how that plays a role. But here, I'm wondering where the COVID-19 shock and the change in the way of business or models out there can have an impact on the on, on, on lower skill uh, workers, in a sense. What's your view on that? Interesting uh, question, Augustine. In fact, um, I'm sort of going to break this up in parts. One is that you're talking about COVID impact, and that certainly leaves a question for everybody because, you know, the dangers, it's, especially in the financial sector, are that, you know, how do you interpret the permanent establishment, right, in this case? So, for example, a senior employee moves to India, wants to spend time here, but, you know, will it get taxed here? Or will it be taxed as fee for technical services? So it remains a huge question, and I think um, we'll only see it in the next two, three years because of the filing, the gate filing of, uh, of returns. So perhaps that's, that, that's going to be a question that we're going to be staring at. And second is, I think, more important, uh, which is also related to the point that I was making about contractualization of labor and uh, Uber, for, for example, right? Like if you look at the UK's case, there's a deliberation whether the, the driver is an employee or, you know, is just a contracted uh, party. And, you know, does it, does it inf do you, can you infer um, PE from that? So... So I think uh, there's a big challenge there. Interestingly, India levied a withholding tax uh, to be made for any uh, platform participant. So now that kind of increases the visibility, but but I did hear about a backlash in terms of this affects the uh, you know, working capital of tech companies adversely. But I think that there again, there's a big question of what employment patterns we might actually see as a result and how that affects the tax base. So I think that connection is, is quite relevant and quite important because this discussion has happened in trade before on, on what happens to real wages uh, when you have freer trade. And I think we're staring at a similar question on what happens when you have a jurisdiction that have relatively lax laws, uh, which allow you to be a resident there and therefore change the ta tax treatment for, for people. But yeah. So I think it's a great interlinkage. No answer there yet, but we probably, I mean, a couple of cases in terms of Uber, but no answer for at least what happened after COVID, perhaps two years down the line, we see that. Thank you. Marion, I see you have your hand up, so I will give you the floor. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question uh, on this lobbying issue that has been uh, coming up. Um, and I'm looking at this from somebody coming from the trade community. So when I look at an institution like the World Trade Organization, it has um, in de facto also been set up to control lobbying because um, but there is an, in the head of the mind of, of the, the reasons behind this was that most governance, particularly in big countries, there would be an interest in protectionism and there would be lobbies that would like you uh, to protect, uh, to push governments to protect them. And by um, the government making an agreement with other governments, you bind the hands of the government to react to the lobbyists. Um, and in the old times, when I was at the WTO, we would become completely nervous when uh, a, a private company would reach out to us. Because that was the one thing we were not allowed to be expose ourselves to as secretariat member to being 
exposed to lobbying from the private sector. Now, um, I'm not familiar with how, how these, whether there's a discussion in the finance world around how to um, maybe restrain lobbying, how to, con uh, how to manage that relationship between the public sector and uh, the private sector when it comes to taxation, uh, uh, tax advantages, for instance. I would be curious to learn more about that. Karen, uh, in fact, uh, that is something I've been deliberating about because I essentially work for an organization that is uh, uh, funded by the Ministry of Finance in India. And, and you know, this is something that I constantly think about before the budget that, you know, is there any influence or, or you know, what is the thinking around changing in taxes? But uh, I think there is a path dependency in taxation. So a lot of times, uh, you know, it's not just lobbies, it's, it's just industry saying that, look, there is a non-neutrality in the taxation that needs to be restored by another change in the budget. And I think what happens then is so many iterative changes that we don't know where we got finally. And, and I think a sort of signing up to an international agreement is, is an interesting way of binding yourself, but then you have to look at the trade-off of sovereignty, which a lot of countries bring up. So what kind of a tax system a country wants is the first answer that they need to have before they sign up because you can't uh, you know because there's one of the reports in UN talks about aligning legal systems across countries which I think is uh, uh, agnostic to cultural differences so so you know for example in India non-compliance used to be a huge issue so now how do you design a tax system around it would be very different from uh, you know how an OECD country might want to design it so I, I would say that Joining an international agreement has its benefits, but has to be weighed in against uh, sovereignty and, and definitely like there is open dialogue uh, between investors and, and the government for sure. Uh, but I think one way to restrain this, as I was saying, is this: there should be coordination, which uh, I've noticed in the recent past that your know, Department of Revenue and other departments tend to talk to each other about proposals uh, that are sort of stepping on each other's uh, shoes. They don't want to do that. So I think uh, that kind of a dialogue can be extremely helpful in uh, reigning in lobbying. Hey, now the next question from Jennifer Farrell is a joint question for Suranjali and Corey. Um, she says, both of you noted near the end of your presentations, the notion of supranational tax enforcement mechanisms and greater coordination with tax uh, trade and investment actors to paraphrase. How do you envisage this, for example, using existing institutions or the necessity for a new platform? Yeah, so um, uh, with the introduction of the goods and services taxes in India, um, the, the tax competition between states has become slightly lower because it's a it's administered by the center and the state sort of accede to those rates and then the revenue is distributed. But uh, there remains a few taxes on which they could compete, which you know is on a limited base of let's say petroleum or, 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 or alcohol. And that's about the only room that they have. So uh, I wouldn't say uh, much there to talk about. Now, now, was there another question? I'm sorry, am I missing? Yes. Um, Corey, do you have anything to add to that question? Or shall we move on? Oh, only the, the toolkit does talk about the need for enforcement mechanisms. So, so, so some type of um, establishment of, of, of some new institution is, is contemplated. But of course, the toolkit also says that, that, that that's probably not realistic in the short term, in which case, you know, some level of, of coordination amongst existing um, players is, is, is more realistic. Um, but, but, but certainly to answer your question, um, it might require a new platform, um, depending on what already exists in the region. Um, but, but, but I think all that can be hoped for in the shorter term is, is, is increased coordination amongst um, ex existing actors. All right, thank you. All right, now moving on, we have a question from Frederick for Surinjali. And Frederick says, you mentioned the discussion about tax incentives as substitutes for disadvantages due to other regulations. Why is it more difficult to convince policymakers of reducing certain unfavorable regulations than implementing tax incentives? 
good question, Frederick, because uh, as I said, and maybe did not detail it is enough, is to say that you know there is there are constraints. So uh, as an economist, when we are taught the first lesson in international you know, trade, we're taught that there are constraints on interest rate and capital controls and and to manage all of these is very difficult. You also have inflation targeting, right? Now <clears throat> for countries like India, capital controls exist for reasons of uh, shocks to foreign exchange, uh, which could impede the ability to import more. And so therefore to get rid of those is, is, is really difficult. Second is that they, there are institutional factors or there are uh, cultural factors that sort of, you know, lead to certain kind of activities existing specifically in India for which a regulation may be introduced. And so therefore to, so, so, so therefore to you know, uh, pull the bars and allow everyone would be a difficult idea. And in that sense, uh, tax remains the only tool within uh, the, the gamut of uh, instruments available. All right, we have uh, two final questions. So one is from Sudarshan. He says, Saranjali, have you factored the impact of non-federal tax incentives by states in India during your study? As you may be aware, there is significant tax competition between states to attract investment in India, offering sales tax reimbursements, electricity tax reimbursements, and the like. Yeah, so as I said, you know, with the introduction, see some of this uh, drained away, uh, I definitely would have to relook at it because all of this was probably examined in the earlier regime. Of course, electricity and petroleum remain outside the ambit of GST. So, so, so as I said, there are limited items under which uh, competition is still, still sort of possible. Thank you. And now we have a question from Stephen Shea. Um, I'll pose it to the panel now, um, since Howard will be discussing dispute resolution. But he says, even if one makes the heroic assumption that tax incentives are net beneficial, if incentives overwhelmingly benefit capital and capital is owned overwhelmingly by the most wealthy in all countries, where does global inequality and in individual wealth looking at distribution within countries and globally fit within this discussion? Okay, so shall I go first? If you would like, absolutely. Um, so I think at the end of the day, inequality is embedded in the system and its design itself. And any sort of derivative of the tax system, which is the dispute resolution or, or, or instruments to provide certainty sort of might perpetuate these. So I think the path correction is to reverse uh, what exists in terms of rates, I would say, and to complicate the tax code itself, you know, uh, simplify the tax code itself. I think it's a great ambition that every tax department has, but hasn't been achieved so far. It only gets more complicated with uh, interpretation. But I think those are the only ways to sort of tackle inequality. I, I, I think all others are um, slightly blunt on or on top of instruments in my view. All right, great. Does anyone else have an answer to that question or shall we move on? Uh, I'll hold my answer from my presentation. It's kind of, uh, the short form is it's core. It's <laughs> absolutely at the core and it's not accidental that we see the distributional impacts we've seen over the last 30 years. That's been the point of it. Well, thank you for that, Howard. And again, Saranjali, thank you so much for your presentation. So now, Howard, great to have you with us. You're our final presenter. For more than 20 years, Howard was the senior international law advisor to the International Institute for Sustainable Development, the IISD. And at the IISD, he advised more than 75 governments around the world on international investment law and policy. He is also an international arbitrator appointed in 2017 to an investment treaty arbitration under the World Bank's International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. And Howard has significant expertise in the national and the natural resources sector, including related international tax and stabilization issues. And Howard began his legal career with the Department of Justice in Canada, spent several years in private practice, 
and then um, joined the IISD. So Howard, again, it is a pleasure to have you here and I will hand over the floor to you. Uh-oh, I think we may have lost Howard. Yes, he yeah. was frozen, but let's wait for a sec, maybe he comes back. Yeah. If I can, I would add something on the local level uh, competition. Someone mentioned the implementation of tax incentives by some national governments. I think that's a crucial issue, not only in India, but in many um, federations or decentralized countries. And I don't know the case of India exactly, and uh, Suranjali knows much better than I do, uh, but I can tell that even here in Switzerland, getting data information on any um, fiscal cost or let alone uh, impact evaluation at the local level can be very tricky. Uh, we a time ago tried to do some research on tax incentives implemented by some national governments in Latin America. And even though for some countries it's compulsory by law or constitution to provide information on that, it's just impossible to get information. I think Brazil has some data on that, but it's really an exception. In the US, you find that in Canada, but it's really worth mentioning exceptions right, rather than the rule. So I don't know, Suranjali, what's the state of the art in India? I guess it's very difficult to run. Yeah, it's difficult to get data. I mean, not even aggregates uh, are available accurately. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Howard, welcome back. I don't know what happened. I, my whole computer shut down. Oh, no. Completely. Well, so, you restored it very quickly. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, all right. The floor is yours. Thank you. So it, if I can, I want to start with a couple of quick comments. First, the disclaimer. Uh, a great deal of what I'm going to talk about today is uncertain. If you go through the tax, I'll be focusing on the dispute settlement proposals uh, in the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 blueprints, in particular Pillar 1. Much of what's in there is still under discussion, to be reviewed, further work being done, and so on. So it's very difficult to pin down with any precision what the actual results will be. Uh, second in that vein, there's a, a whole series of persistent rumors that all of the dispute settlement with respect to beyond amount A is going to be dropped. Whether that's the case or not, I have no idea, but there's a lot of rumors to that effect. So obviously that would have a huge impact on the final results if that's uh, a decision that gets made. Uh, so there's, there's a number of uncertainties that come from the text and you have to bear with me as a result of that. And maybe after this meeting, we'll, we'll learn more. Uh, second, and this relates to some uh, discussion that started last week and is somewhat relevant to this week. At the end of last week, um, uh, Lise Johnson asked me if I would comment on the risk of investment treaty arbitration in relation to tax incentives being removed by governments who are subject to stabilization provisions in their relationships with individual investors. So I've prepared some notes on that that uh, I've sent to Irma and I think we're gonna try and put it in the chat or uh, send it around. So you'll know that that's what those long uh, chats are about. There are a series of notes relating specifically to that issue from that question. And third is a preliminary comment. I wanna actually go back specifically to this presentation to Marion's initial presentation. <laughs> 
So go back to where we began. Uh, and Marion's comment uh, in particular that redistrib redistribution happens somewhere else. We do rules, the, the distributive impact isn't our business and the fixing the negative impacts of distribution of the rules on distribution is someone else's job, not ours. I couldn't disagree more. And I don't think Marion was saying that in a way to support that view that that's the way it should be, as opposed to indicate that's the approach that is taken by the institutions. But to me, I think if we look back historically to the 60s, 70s and 80s, when wealth distribution was much more balanced than it is now, especially within countries, um, and we look at the impact of the evolution of international economic law over the period from the 80s to today, the chief impact has been the redistribution of wealth quite by design. And a big part of that is because the rules on trade and investment and e-commerce and tax and other things have begun to focus not on access to economic activity, but on protecting the right to maximize profit of those who already have the most, the 1% the in colloquial terms. And there's been that an important shift from creating access to economic activity to uh, providing rights and remedies that promote the maximization of profit, which is a very different thing than rights to access economic activity and a very different goal. So I, I think those, in, those results have been quite intended and are quite part of the systemic design that we see today. And in my view, international arbitration, for reasons I'll get into in more detail, international arbitration has actually become the enforcement tool for those very processes. Uh, and that's the real risk of transferring international arbitration processes to tax law, not ephemeral notions of sovereignty, there are real implications in terms of global impacts from doing so. So with that, I'll briefly get into some of the specifics in the Pillar 1 uh, Blueprint Tax Certainty Proposal and look at the key issue of how far does it go to expand the role of private companies in the international arbitration process and then go to some issues that I hope create context for the argument that uh, simply transferring international arbitration processes to tax law is not going to produce the kind of results that are good for international governance in my view. Um, so that's the question of is arbitration justice, the institutionalization, process that comes with international arbitration uh, and the whole uh, impacts and lessons learned from, from international investment law and all that within about 18 minutes now. Um, the current state of dispute settlement in international tax in a very schematic form focuses on government cooperation and information sharing on the mutual agreement processes to date, taxpayer involvement in the, the MAP process is generally limited with uh, a broader scope for taxpayer participation within the EU intra-EU system. Uh, looking beyond MAP to actually the MAP arbitration process, that's really in, in the context of the MLI, been limited to around 30 states that have covered themselves with that. So it is not nearly as widespread as some would want people to believe. Simply the fact that it's available in the M MLI doesn't mean the uptake has been huge within that context. Uh, and we need to look at the uptake there. Uh, Taxpayer involvement again is still limited in terms of the MAP arbitration in most cases. Um, and there is, in general, no binding impact of the MAP process, even if it goes to arbitration, 
on the taxpayer. The taxpayer has a right to opt out at any time, even after a decision is made. Uh, and so you have, in, in terms of the notion of tax certainty, you have a tax certainty notion that's one way. Tax certainty for the investor, but if the investor doesn't like the result, there's no tax certainty for the governments that are involved. That part of the equation simply fall, falls off the table. Um, I'm getting too animated and knocking things on my desk over. Uh, and there's generally very limited transparency, limited public access, limited public awareness of the final decisions, uh, except within the EU context again. If we look at pillar one, the tax certainty proposals that come at the end of pillar one, uh, and let me see if I can move this here. Um, there's an expanded map process in relation to amount A. So I'm not gonna get into the technical details of what amount A is. I hope most people are generally familiar with it, um, but it, it would be the amount of money redistributed for the digital tax reform portion uh, of, of the reforms. Uh, so there's basically an expanded map process that sets out what is essentially a broad negotiating mechanism with a review panel of government officials followed if needed by a determination panel uh, of unknown officials, but the push is clearly for non-government officials to be uh, in charge of the determination panel. Uh, again, it would be binding on states, but not on taxpayers, right through to a determination panel, a result which could still be rejected by taxpayers. Uh, the taxpayer can reject the review panel or determination panel at any time. There seems to be a question raised as to whether that should be the case for determination panels, but there's no question, not a single question raised as to whether uh, taxpayers should be able to reject the results of, re of a review panel, the stage one process that they themselves initiate. That's, that's just a given that they'll be entitled to reject that result, even though states will not be entitled to reject it. Um, and uh, then there's the, the arbitration add-on that is being promoted with a more extended role of the taxpayer. And I'll come to that in a minute open questions who the arbitrators are still, which is a critical, the most critical issue probably. Um, and again, uh, making it clear that even with the arbitration add-on, uh, at no time will the result be uh, binding on the actual taxpayer unless they agree to it being binding. Uh, so what we real, and, and even then, it's only binding on a year to year basis. It doesn't carry forward for the exact same issues. So if the taxpayer doesn't apply for tax certainty, the binding nature of a decision in year X is only for year X, not X plus the next few years. Uh, and, and even at that, it may never be public for others to be able to see whether it's being complied with or not. Uh, so essentially, there's a massive mandatory negotiating process for states within the threshold amounts for amount A, the states that qualify. There's a process, in my view, that legally tries to divide larger and smaller economies of developing countries, which from a broader political economy perspective, I think creates a lot of risk for developing countries. <coughs> And in a couple of places, one sees uh, the role of the OECD Secretariat expressed as providing, and I use one quote here, significant guidance to parties as to how the uh, review and determination panels should unfold. That, in my view, creates real institutional questions as well. Um, beyond amount A, there's clearly a goal to move to mandatory arbitration on issues, uh, on any issues for large size MEs that are in scope for amount A and presumably for the global minimum tax. Uh, and in one, at one point, I'll come back to this, they actually talk about it being a quid pro quo for the largest companies 
to have greater arbitration rights in exchange for being subject to amount A in the global minimum tax, the burdens it imposes on them. And so the, the reward will be to expand arbitration rights under the scheme set out. And it seems to me that's a highly dubious concept and, and approach to be taking here. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we see the role of the taxpayer expanding, uh, still open questions be in, uh, beyond amount A as to who the uh, arbitrators would be, uh, and a whole series of unresolved issues set out right at the end of that part of, of the tax certainty chapter, where more work needs to be done, but there's no a resolution and no public availability, availability of that extra work to date that I'm aware of. So again, a lot of unanswered questions. Now, for some reason, I'm not able to, okay. Um, so if we look at the, the issue of the expansion of arbitration to private companies as the kind of core issue or one of the core issues, um, in terms of initiating the extended map arbitration between states for amount A, that's the purpose, is to expand that opportunity for private corporations to do that. Uh, they initiate the process with their own uh, amount A self-assessment, which in and of itself may not be the most critical issue, but it is the starting point. In, in other words, they set the starting point for the process. Um, and then can initiate the early tax certainty provisions, which again are binding on states, but not binding on them. Uh, participating in the extended map. So the first slide was initiating it. This is their participation in it. Uh, and we see very clear statements like any approach to achieve early tax certainty relies upon active and transparent participation by an MNE group. So the level of participation is certainly going to be bumped up from the MLI processes that we've seen to date. And that's clearly expressed as the goal. Personally, I'd rather see it be transparent than non-transparent happening behind the scenes, behind closed doors. But we're still talking about a process where the private sector role is going to increase. Um, and indeed the failure of the MNE to cooperate is given as the only reason governments should have to deny the request for certainty. So that's, that's the level of, of bargain that's being set up, the type of bargain. Um, and again, the MNE can reject the result uh, of either the panel uh, and the determination panel uh, here and revert to the courts at any time. So they get two kicks at the can, at least the, the, the tax certainty process. And if they don't like the result of that, they can go back to domestic courts. And then in many cases, there'll be a third kick at the can with the ISDS, the investor state dispute settlement process uh, coming out of investment treaty arbitrations. So a lot of direction that really favors the, the participation and role of the MNEs. Um, beyond amount A, so initiating arbitration between states on other issues, and this is the beyond amount A question that we see in section 9.3.3 of the blueprint, um, the pillar one. Uh, and here again, the discussions are, are quite it's indicated the discussion, discussions are still quite fluid and we haven't seen what that means since October of last year. Um, but they talk about providing arbitration to provide greater certainty for, for MNE groups where it is most needed. And that's left kind of open, but we see the direction starting right from that type of statement. Uh, and the binding dispute settlement is put in the context of dispute prevention and an expanded map process, but we still come to the binding dispute settlement option. Uh, and, and again, another quote, in light of the fundamental importance of tax certainty as an element of pillar one. And that's the context binding arbitration is put forward in. And a reference to 
the broad dispute resolution mechanism, not a narrow one, but a broad one as the goal, uh, and so on. And, and transfer pricing and permanent establishment are foreseen as the main issues, but not all the issues, especially for in-scope multinationals. In other words, the biggest multinationals in the world will, under the scheme set out in the blueprint, have the broadest array of uh, dispute settlement, mandatory dispute settlement rights. Uh, there is an exclusion for small economies with no or limited map cases or experience, but that's subject to elective binding dispute settlement processes. Uh, and the language in the text is actually to get used to the process. In other words, training wheels for developing countries or smaller economies. So you can get used to it as if the critical issue for them is uh, simply, you know, the fact that they don't understand the process as much or haven't used it as much. And that's why they're opposed to expanding it as opposed to the real risks of expanding it. So if only they got their training wheels on and learned how to do it, then their opposition to the process uh, being expanded would simply disappear. Uh, and in terms of initiating arbitration directly against states, here is where there's the most kind of obfuscation in the text, in my view. Uh, it appears to be the direction they're trying to go in for the largest MNEs, um, but it's hard to tell exactly if the intention is to expand the scope of the map process first and then attach the arbitration to that or simply allow uh, certain issues to go directly to arbitration, irrespective of uh, how extensive the map process is. Um, but again, that idea of a broader, uh, a broader certainty uh, set of, of provisions for tax certainty for the largest MNEs as a quid pro quo for undertaking the amount, or, uh, amount A obligations. Um, and so we have quite an extensive process going on um, and a lot of uncertainty on critical issues. I want to put that in the context quickly of international economic law more generally. And here I'm going to start to go much more quickly through the slides. But if we, if we look at international economic law as a systemic process with different interrelated elements, trade, intellectual property, investment, e-commerce, tax treaties, and international investment contracts, which are a critical part of the tax issues when we look at incentives, when we look at stabilization and so on. Um, all of that is increasingly being undergirded by international arbitration processes. And they are being used more and more frequently as a tool to support certain directions in the regime. But that arbitration is not unique to tax and not unique to investment. It's becoming ubiquitous across the international economic law uh, set of instruments that we see. And I think in that context, we need to start with the question, is international arbitration a tool for justice? Because I think justice is a critical element here and certainly the, the presumptive intent in the tax reform is for greater economic justice. But are these tools relating to actually to justice? And in my view, we really need to distinguish adjudication of a dispute and justice because they are not the same thing. Uh, arbitration reflects a concept of one-off adjudication of a dispute. Resolve that dispute between two parties and that's your job done. The systemic implications of that resolution from a broader justice perspective, from the broader perspective of a public international law regime are not part of that equation, simply resolving the dispute. Uh, An adjudication of a dispute is really a minimalist concept, whereas justice is a much more holistic systemic concept. And we already see that approach approach of resolving a dispute becoming the 
core as opposed to a system that promotes international tax justice. Uh, and we see that in the very concept of baseball arbitration as a primary focus of one of the options. Baseball arbitration comes purely from a negotiating context, not a rule of law context. That's where it comes from. It's about who has the maximum power in a negotiation. And then you take the last offers and some neutral party presumably decides which party has the, in fact, has the most negotiating power to get the result they want. It has nothing to do with the rule of law and it removes the rule of law from the actual considerations. And the fact that we see baseball arbitration almost preferred to independent reasoned rule of law based arbitration is a, should be a really troubling concern to many people. Uh, but again, it focuses on the issue of resolving a dispute, not applying justice, not applying the rule of law. Um, and we have a number of problems that come with the general arbitration process. Um, it's not subject to oversight easily. There's a legal right of arbitrators to be wrong in law in international arbitration systems that is reinforced in domestic processes that allow judicial review of arbitrations. Being wrong in law is not a ground to overturn an arbitration decision, full stop, full stop. There's no but that comes with that, okay? So, and arbitrators know that. And when you say that to arbitrators, they will say, how dare you suggest an arbitrator will not follow the rule of law in reaching a decision? I'm sorry. I, I, I'm not even gonna answer that process here, that question here. There's issues of inconsistency. And when you have a lack of transparency, you don't even know when you have inconsistency. Donald Rumsfeld passed away yesterday and we all remember his known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Well, that's exactly what you have when you have a non-transparent and inconsistent set of results. A lot of known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, and that's not a way to run a public international law dispute settlement system and tax treaties are part of public international law. Uh, we have conflicts of interest. We have between arbitrators sitting one day as arbitrators and one day as lawyers on the same issue. Um, and we have the fact that arbitration has become a big business against governments. It's a hundred million, multiple hundreds of millions of dollars business every year for major law firms. It's a huge business and they treat it as a business. Um, and it becomes an entirely corrupting setting. So that's just on around the issue of is arbitration justice? There's also a critical issue of a lack of organizational structure in international arbitration, but it would be wrong to assume that that means there is no organizing structure. What it actually means is that a formal structure is be, has been replaced by an informal structure. And an informal structure in some ways can actually be more insidious than a formal one because you don't see it operating in daylight. It operates behind the scenes. Uh, and that includes the role of appointment of arbitrators as a reward for doing good. It includes building business relationships. It includes a whole series of things that are socializing people into an approach to ruling as arbitrators and being part of the arbitration world um, that is extremely risky in my view. And I'll give us one quick example. In the international arbitration uh, under investment treaties, the investor state dispute settlement system with over 1,100 cases so far, there are exactly two, two arbitrators who come from a civil society background, two. Philip Sands and myself, that's it. Uh, so where do they all come from? Because it isn't broadly based. So we need to look at those issues as a systemic issue and again in relation to 
Are we resolving a one-off dispute? Are we building a system that supports the rule of law in international taxation issues? Um, and we see some studies on this. Catherine Rogers, who is one of the most supportive academics of international arbitration, has looked at this and, and a number of others, and I won't go into detail on this slide. Um, so who are the decision makers? A critical issue. Uh, their relationship to international business is a critical issue. And indeed, the biggest finding of Catherine Rogers is it's a, a uh, collaboration between international legal elites and international economic elites. And she has all the data to show it. That is what actually drives the expansion of international arbitration into new countries and into new sectors. The club replicating itself in different countries and in different uh, sectors of the economy. And that's the kind of thing that we, we see over and over again. Uh, other issues, we've seen the transformation of arbitration from a shield of last resort to a sort of first resort. And certainly when you allow multiple remedies to taxpayers, that's exactly the result you're going to get. The more remedies they have, the more they will be used. In that context, the arbitration process takes on a life of its own. If you build it, they will come. And after 20 plus years doing international arbitration work, I'm getting much closer to 30 now, uh, it never fails to amaze me how creative uh, investors and their lawyers can be in relation to new claims. And trying to reform the system after experience is gain is almost impossible. So you need to be really careful what you design in the first place because changing it will be much harder afterwards. Um, the UNSA trial process is, is an example of that, the reform of investor state dispute settlement, now in its third full year at the UNSA trial working group process, and it has at least four more years to go. And the result of that is widely expected to be minimalist at best right now. So it just shows the, the difficulty of changing the system once you start it. Um, and a bigger role and more critical one, and this is where Catherine Rogers' analysis becomes important. Um, private dispute settlement, when it begins to take over, in itself becomes an instrument of international economic power. And when that power is managed by a combination of legal and economic elites as the informal institutional structure of the international arbitration world, which it largely is, uh, then that power has purpose and it has meaning and it has impact. And the question of whether or not that power should be extended to the international tax world is a really critical question, I think. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead very quickly so that there's time for questions. Essentially, what, what we end up seeing is this type of system, sorry, again, this point that I just wanna make again quickly, the shift in international economic law from working to create economic opportunities to now working as a bulwark for capital owners to maximize their profit is a fundamental shift. And that is necessarily at the expense of other economic stakeholders. Maximizing profits means someone else's economic benefit from that activity will be smaller. That's what it means. And so we need to look at those distributional impacts and, and risks of a system that of international arbitration that is essentially run by the beneficiaries of that right to maximum profit. We are giving them the keys to the store when they also manage the dispute settlement process. And what you see is the ability, and here we see what we now know as a K recovery from COVID, 
but is in fact the distributional impacts if we look at public welfare uh, along the lines, uh, one axis and um, the impact of the breadth of international economic law today with all of the components of international trade agreements. And if we look at the distributional impacts colloquially in terms of the 1% versus the rest, what we see is the 1% being given the international economic law tools, the arbitration tools in order to maximize their profit, to maximize their positioning at the expense of other stakeholders. So when we talk about redistribution being done somewhere else, at the same time, those very instruments that are helping create and support the skewed distribution we see today are giving the tools to those very actors that gain the most to restrict the ability of government to undertake the redistribution through any of the economic, social, and environmental tools that need to be brought to bear in order to do that. The tools to restrict governments making that redistribution effort are being constrained by those rules themselves and the dispute settlement process that comes with it. And that is working within countries and working between countries. And so we see a very serious potential implication of extending that to tax law. I'll just go to the last bullet here. This is the last slide. I think if we look at the question of dispute settlement for tax governance, we need to know that it's fit for purpose. We need to know that it's going to be designed for good governance, good tax governance, not just to prevent double taxation of MNEs. That's not enough of, of a design purpose. But at present, it's pretty much the focal point of the design purpose within the Pillar 1 context. I'll leave it at that. Great. Howard, that was truly illuminating. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, very, very excellent. You raised a lot of great um, food for thought. I know we have several questions for you here in the chat, but given our time constraints, um, we only have time for two. Um, so first I'm going to pull up a question here from Stephen Shea. He said, Howard, you emphasize the optionality available to the ME in this process. How would you limit it? Would you take the ME out of the process as an old mutual agreement procedure? Would you require the ME to accept the outcome of arbitration and waive other remedies or are there other proposals out there? Uh, yeah, I think first, um, I, I would definitely suggest making sure that the results are binding. Uh, if you start the process, taxpayers have an option. Nobody forces them to start the international process. If they choose to start it, they should be bound by it. That to me is a minimum step, uh, a minimum initial step. Um, and it, it protects the tax certainty for governments also uh, who have none in the process as it's set out now. Um, second, I would be incredibly careful to make sure that uh, multinational companies get one remedy and they choose their remedy. It, whether it's an international dispute settlement process, domestic courts, a MAP process, whatever it is, you get one kick at the can, not two, three, four, five. In India, when we go back, uh, Saranjali didn't mention the particular case, but I mean, at, at one point, India was facing 11 international arbitrations over the cancellation of the Darbol Dam, 11 over the exact same issue they couldn't even find an arbitration firm to run their side of the case because everyone was involved with the people making the claims, all of the top firms. That, and that's the reality, that's what happened. So you get one choice, one remedy, you make your choice and all other remedies are locked out. I think that's essential. Um, and I think we gotta wait, get away from this notion of preserving court rights. Nobody has taken away any company's private rights to use the court. The company makes that choice when it chooses an international process. There's no loss of rights. They're exercising the different rights they have and making a choice, and that's it. 
It's, that's what happens in most of the investment arbitration. There's no reason it should be any different in the tax. So I think those are three, at least initial points. Thank you for that. And now we'll move on to Ricardo. I see you have your hand raised, so I'll give you the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Howard, for your excellent presentation. I just would like to, to, to make you a comment because what you are trying to say, if I understood correctly, that uh, investors in a way are abusing these uh, investment treaties to, let's say, maximize their profits and in a way uh, win their claims against the state. No? And we have seen progressively how many investors are using the investment treaty channel. So my, my question to you is, uh, what do you think about the curve out uh, provisions in, in bilateral and bilateral, bilateral investment treaties? Do you think that we should interpret restrictively? Do you think that we should, uh, uh, let's say, eliminate or make more clear that taxation cannot be uh, dealt with in investment bilateral treaties? How we work with uh, these uh, taxation curve outs no? to, to prevent the effects that you are, are describing? Thank you. Thank you very much, Howard. Yeah. Um... So a, a lot of international investment agreements today include either a complete carve out of tax issues and tribunals have looked at that and interpreted them appropriately in most cases where the carve out exists uh, and found they have no jurisdiction over the issue. Um, and for a number of the treaties that don't have a complete carve out, there's a partial carve out or and or uh, a process whereby the government get the first kick at the can to see if this is the type of dispute that should go to an arbitration tribunal. And if the governments decide together that it shouldn't go, then it won't, jurisdiction will be denied. And there's other treaties that phrase that in the reverse. Um, if the governments unless the governments decide it should go to arbitration under the investment treaty, it won't. So you have both what you see to some extent, both ways. Uh, I think that carve out is important. Uh, and I think government should be very clear on what they want to include or not. There's nothing illegitimate about it. Uh, the Canada European uh, investment chapter in, in the economic uh, uh, cooperation agreement in CETA uh, has a carve out that requires government approval of tax issues going to arbitration. Uh, if Canada and the European Union can do that, there's no reason developing countries can't do that. It's a perfectly legitimate tool uh, to use and to prevent abuse. Uh, and let me go back to your first point about the risk of abuse. What we see very often in investment treaties is the threat of initiating an arbitration having a massive impact. Uh, the regulatory chill issue. And I know personally, I can give you one example that's been talked about publicly many times, and that's tobacco legislation. Uh, and we know from public statements that when Philip Morris sued Australia for its tobacco packaging laws, um, the government of New Zealand held off doing the same, the exact same legislation until the end of that arbitration process, almost four years later. So basically Philip Morris made back the cost of its arbitration by keeping other markets open. And I know for a fact that repeated because I saw the threatening letters to at least half a dozen African countries who did not legislate precisely because of the threat of arbitration, precisely because of that. So we see both the fact of the arbitration, but the threat of the arbitration having a major impact. And when your arbitration process is, is really being set up behind uh, a negotiation process, not a rule of law based process, but a negotiation process, then those risks really become inordinate, I think. Well, thank you to all of our panelists, to Marion, to Corey, to Suranjali, and to Howard. This was an excellent roundtable. These three hours just flew by, and I wish we had more time to address all of the questions.
But um, unfortunately, we must move to our concluding remarks. So with that, I will hand over the mic to Irma and she will um, offer some closing remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for staying. I know it has been five Thursdays from two to five. It's not easy to just keep the whole three hours and we have been able to hopefully for you to offer different views and looking at the need to develop this topic a little more. I have to leave in one minute because I have to teach <laughs> online. So, but I wanted to say that there are two issues for me that will be important. And from the project of Globe Tax Gov, funded by the European Research Council, we look at the governance and the governance has been also mentioned through all the workshops and the governance of the WTO also the OECD with the PEPS inclusive framework, and of course, of the investment uh, tribunals of the UNCITRAL rules and the ACS. And in the second thing that we also have is not only tax, to discuss about tax, but to involve also trade and investment and to develop this policy coherence. So the policy coherence, not only from the ministries, but also in terms of uh, international organizations. This is for me. I want to say thank you. All the slides, everything, uh, recordings are available online. So thank you so much. Thank you for the other co-organizers. Thank you for the panelists. And I have to leave, but uh, you are in good hands because it will be Hildegun and Agustine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Irma. And now um, we will hear from Hildegun with a few closing remarks. Okay, so thank you very much for, uh, for your excellent presentations today and thank you to everybody who has have participated in, the, uh, in this whole series of, uh, of uh, workshops. It has been really interesting and I would like to pick up one of the points that um, Marion made and also uh, Irma made just now and that is uh, incentives do not work. Tax incentives do not work. That's the one point. And, and the other one is um, policy coherence. So if we look at, um, so if we, if we keep in mind that incentives do not work all that well for, for taxes and investment. So then why do we make so much effort to introduce them and to, uh, to try to uh, to design policies around them, and here it's uh, it's interesting to look at the policy in the trade area and the investment area, because if we look at the trade policy area, it's very much about disciplining the subsidies, put disciplines on uh, on taxes to avoid distorting the markets and uh, to avoid tilting the playing field. So that's kind of the, the uh, approach taken in, in trade policy. And then if you look at investment policy and largely it's supported by the development banks. So here it's the incentives are more to attract investment, to uh, attract investment for all good purposes like creating jobs, like uh, transferring technology, like um, yeah, creating development in broad, and then you go back to trade agreements. You have the trims. You are not supposed to uh, to kind of attach conditions to uh, to um, investment that they create jobs that they uh, that they source locally, and that they uh, the conditions are that they need to export. So there are really kind of discrepancies here. And then you have um, the BIPs, which is also based on kind of the assumption that incentives work. So uh, firms will allocate their, uh, their um, investment, at least uh, their portfolio investment and their activities to low tax areas events to, uh, to avoid taxes. So we seem to base that policy on, uh, on uh, the assumption that incentives work. So I think it's, it's really something that we have put on the table, these, these uh, areas of contradicting uh, 
uh, or incoherent policies. And I think there is one, one discipline that we need to, uh, to get a better handle of that, and that's political science. So we have discussed this among economists and lawyers, but uh, we probably need political scientists also to explain why this is such a big policy area when both economists and to some extent lawyer believe that uh, incentives do not work. So I think there is a lot of research to be done in, in this area. So I leave it at that. Thank you, Hildegan. And now we will move to Augustine for our final remarks. Yeah, I would just want to thank um, all the speakers today, but also the speakers that we had during the four previous sessions that were great too. We um, are delighted to have had a great um, lineup of panelists across the whole series. Uh, thank you very much, Nana, for taking the time again today. Thanks for the help. Uh, I, I will stop here. I just want to, to thank everybody, all the audience. And I see, I pretty much agree with what Irma, most of the panelists and Hilligan uh, have flagged today. I see, think that this is a very relevant topic, a hot topic. We are all following the discussion happening right now. Uh, so I very much look forward to what this will trigger in terms of next steps. I'm sure that there's not the last event on, on this topic that we, but also others um, likely will be uh, organizing. So yeah, very much look, uh, looking forward to stay in touch with all of you. And yeah, this is just the first step, I hope. And, and I hope to see you around. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thanks, Thank man. you. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.